what kind of a podcast episode begins with talking about catching bugs and snakes and amphibians and ends with talking about Kant's transcendental idealism and BDSM gay sex? The answer is the one you're listening to, because I'm going to have Daryl Stark on to talk about a book he translated called Homesickness by Lai Jing. Now, did Lai Jing set out to write about any of those topics I mentioned? Perhaps not. So it'll be up for you, the listener, to find out how this all ties together. What's the, what are those two breads that I described and what's the, the literary sandwich, the sandwich filling, I should say, in the middle. Before I can sort of introduce you to Daryl, we're going to do the news first, the Church of Fake News. I'll say b- before I launch right into the news, you probably noticed it's been a long time since I did an episode. That's because I started a new job and I moved house, so I'm not recording in uh, Dundee anymore. This time I'm in England. I'm in Cheshire. I'm going to be working just outside of Greater Manchester. So the location changes nothing. The job, it's a more full-on job than the one I had before. So that might mean slower episode output because it'll be less free time basically. But I guess we'll just see. So yeah, that that's all the news. Other than that, I guess, sorry, that's all the personal news I should say. Other personal news is it's really hot today, so I'll try not to linger on this news section too much, just in case my throat completely dries up and you have to listen to absolutely horrific dry mouth. So, the Church of Fig News. The first item, this is a, a book, an academic book that came out that really caught my eye. It's called Healing with Poisons. I shall read you the blurb for this book now. I should also say this book it's available online as an e-text. The whole thing is browsable on your web browser and it's a really nice interface. So worth checking out if you've got a bit of time to read something on your phone or your laptop. So here's the blurb. At first glance, medicine and poison might seem to be opposites. But in China's formative era of pharmacy, which is 200 to 800 CE, poisons were strategically deployed as healing agents to cure everything from chills to pains to academ- epidemics. Healing with Poisons explores the ways physicians, religious devotees, court officials and lay people use powerful substances to both treat intractable illnesses and enhance life. It illustrates how the Chinese concept of du, du, sorry, a word carrying a core meaning of potency, led pr- practitioners to devise a variety of techniques to con- uh, to transform dangerous poisons into if, oh, this word is split by a hyphen across the line, efficacious like effective, basically. Efficacious medicines. Recounting scandals and controversies involving poisons from the era of division to the early Tang period, Yan Liu considers how the concept of Du was central to the ways people of medieval China perceived both their bodies and the body politic. Liu also examines a wide range of Du possessing minerals, plants and animals in classical Chinese pharmacy, including the highly poisonous herb aconite and the popular arsenic drug five stone powder. By recovering alternative modes of understanding wellness and the body's interaction with potent medicines, this study cautions against arbitrary classifications and exemplifies the importance of paying attention to the technical, political and cultural connotations in which substances become truly meaningful. There you go. So, that sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? I certainly think it does. Here is the next piece of news. Now this is, uh, it's drugs again actually. Um, This is a a long-form article uh, written by friend of the show, Dylan Levi King, uh, who's guested on two episodes now, and it is entitled Ketamine and the Return of the Party State, and it's up on Palladium Palladium Mag, and Palladium Mag? Palladium Magazine, sorry, you can read the whole thing as a webpage. Um, I know Dylan had, um, he'd, he'd been sort of gathering bits and bobs about this topic on his blog before, but basically it's a sort of a history set in parallel with the political history of, um, one ketamine in the PRC and two um, the Chinese Communist Party from like reform and opening through to the present day so 80s up to Xi Jinping's uh, removal of his uh, own term limits and how the two are more connected than you might think. I won't say more than that other than it's a great read. It is pretty long though so don't sit down and think you can read it in five minutes because it's a long longer form article. Okay last piece of news. This is from uh, the world of academic publishing. Um, I'm just going to check actually if this, if any of this stuff is open access or if you need academic access to read it. That's pretty important. Um, no, I think this is only available through university institutions, but perhaps you have means to access these things depending on who you are as a reader. So anyway, I'll say what this actually is. It's a Q, sorry, it's not a Q&A, it's an A&Q 
answers and questions on Chinese Sinofuturisms, so sort of sci-fi visions of a Chinese future, basically. This is in the um, the journal called Verge, Studies in Global Asia's, you know, the very popular academic use of a plural there, not just a single Asia, but Asia's, and hence why this is Sinofuturisms, and the little s in the end is in brackets just to make you extra clear that this is sort of academic wordplay. Now, these have been put together by uh, pe- two two people I follow on um, Twitter, one of whom I'm sure is a show listener, the other one I'm not so sure. Um, so that the latter there is, sorry, the former there is Virginia L. Conn, who studies these things, basically. And the other is um, someone who's literally, I only know their Twitter name, Hootsuka, um, who was in like Lake, I think, and then Z as in like, child and then go as in big brother who would say go so there's five of these a and q's one is called sinofuturisms one is called three theses on the sinofuturist city one is called sinofuturism at sinofuturism and its uses contemporary art and diasporic desire and the last one is my favorite title sino no futurism so uh, not much else to say other than the rest of the essays and sort of opening matter in the book are about Asia in general, so they're not China specific, although some of some of it is. But um, it's just this one section of the one issue of the journal, which is on this sort of Chinese sci-fi topic. Um, yeah, so that is that is our churchific news. So I'll stop yapping on. I'll let my dry throat recover, and you can listen to my interview with Daryl Stark. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, so on the show we have Daryl Stark. Hi, Daryl. How's it going? And what have you been up to? Hi, Angus. Um, thanks for having me on the show. It's uh, it's going okay. I've been um, been pretty tired lately. Uh, I'm 48 now, and 48 is not the same as 46. So, finding the past couple of years, I've really slowed down. I've been doing a lot of uh, nature photography. I've gotten into herping, uh, looking at at snakes and and frogs and reptiles at night. I'm taking my daughter herping. <laughs> and, uh, I'm hoping to uh, learn more about nature because um, it, it relates to my uh, my academic research. I'm a, a professor at uh, university here in Hong Kong, and I have to do research on translation. So I'm hoping to research um, ethnobiology, the uh, study of uh, biological knowledge, traditional biological knowledge um, of this uh, people in Taiwan called Saedic. So the Saedic have uh, traditional knowledge about nature. I'm trying to to learn about it because often they're translating it from uh, from their own language into Mandarin, and then they also draw on text in Mandarin, translating those into uh, into Saedic. So that's my my research. It's the summertime, right? So we're not teaching. We're supposed to be doing research. I'm doing some research. I'm also um, revising a translation of a novel uh, called uh, The Mermaid's Tale, which I think is a great title in English. It works better in English. Than it does in Chinese because of the pun on on tail. It's a story about a mermaid, right? It's spelled actually T A L E, so it's the story about a mermaid, but it's also in part about her her tail. <laughs> the, the mermaid's tail in the novel is a is a symbol. So I'm uh, mostly keeping myself busy. Excellent. Perhaps this sounds ridiculous, but I feel a little bit the same about being 28 versus 26. What you said about being 48 versus 46. Maybe it's something about the number eight. It just rounds up that that little bit more easily to 10 than six does. Right. Yeah. Hopefully it's like a, just a bad number and, and uh, 29 will be better than 28 and 49 will be for, better than 48. But I think I'm, I'm on the downhill here. So <laughs> you, you, you haven't quite started yet. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll get there. So you mentioned quite a lot there about being a translator and you mentioned um, an interest in nature. So it probably is worth me pointing out that I believe you've translated one of the other books I've covered on this Taiwan season by Wu Ming Yi. Um, we covered his The Man with the Compound Ice. Um, that's one of your English translations, right? Yeah, I translated um, Fu Yin Ren, uh, The Man with the Compound Ice, and that actually had a huge impact on me personally. I took uh, a trip to the East Coast. It's set on the East Coast of Taiwan, and I, I tried to find all the places that are in the novel, like all the scenes in the novel or are inspired by places in East Coast Taiwan, and I, like I started looking at the um, the plants there. The tri- started trying to identify the trees, and there's um there's lots of beetles in the novel, right? Um, yeah, common and and rare uh, beetles in Taiwan coastal 
um, creatures and creatures that live up in the mountains. So I started trying to, to identify uh, everything I was looking at. And uh, here I am, I don't know, eight years later, and, and I'm still at it. So um, translating, that, translating that novel uh, was not just, uh, it didn't just get my career as a translator started. It, it really kind of changed the direction of my life, putting it a little bit overly dramatically, but it, it had a huge impact on me. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've mentioned this on the show before, talking with other guests, that I think there's something very special about literature or fiction, which has is sort of um, tagged to real places on the world that you can go and vi- visit, do a sort of a literary pilgrimage to. I think that's um, it's something I've done a few times, um, including a bit self-indulgently. Um, I visited a place I'd used in one of my own short stories, um, and then I went to the, 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 the place and I found something I didn't expect to find. So you can find all sorts of... Was this after you'd finished the story? Yeah, this was after I'd finished it, yes. Did you go back and revise? Uh, I, I might have, yeah. So without trying to sound too grim in the story, I, it's a it's a young guy. He's um, walking along a bridge because he's um, thinking about ending it all and something causes him not to. And I crossed, It was a it's a road bridge. I crossed it myself on foot and found just about halfway across the road bridge, there was a breakdown telephone call, a telephone with SOS written on it. And I was like, mm. oh, that's very potent. So I think... That- <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, went back into the story and I think I added the phone. Oh, that's wonderful. Anyway, getting back on track, my next question was going to be, tell the listeners a bit about yourself. I think you've done that, but can you tell us a little bit about your journey as a translator? Okay, uh, sure. I was born in uh, Edmonton, uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, Western Canada, but we're east of the, the Rocky Mountains. Like, about four hours east of the Rocky Mountains. So it's not like I could see the Rocky Mountains when I was growing up, but we often drove there to go skiing, cross-country skiing or, or downhill skiing. And um, I did a degree in English literature. I think we might have a similar academic background. Mm. Was your um, degree also in English? Yeah, English. Your BA? Lit. Yep. And English then you went on to do uh, a master's in, uh, in publishing? Bingo, yep. Right. Well, I didn't go on to do anything immediately. I, I went to Taiwan in, um, in 1995 with my best friend at the time, Alex B. Croft. And at the time, I was uh, homesick for Canada. And after the year was out, uh, we immediately went back home. <laughs> and um, I found that uh, being home wasn't, wasn't the same as it had been when I was growing up there and uh, started to feel a little bit homesick for Taiwan. I'd already met a, a woman uh, by that time that I'm uh, now married to and I've had a, a kid with. Uh, so the next year I went back to Taiwan. Uh, that was, uh, I guess, 1996. And um, after another year in Taiwan, I got extremely sick. I got uh, bronchitis for six months. And uh, so I went back to Canada to try to recover and to try to find myself. And um, I was going to be a naturopathic doctor. I was going to do all sorts of different things. And th- eventually I took a course in classical Chinese. Have you done any classical Chinese in, in your undergrad or? Um, no. Uh, my, so my experience with China, I'll do this quickly because the listeners know it. I went there just to be a TEFL teacher uh, right after my undergrad. And if you include about six months being back home between that and returning to China, that was sort of four years between that and my master's. Um, mm-hmm. So, but my, my my Mandarin never got that far past taxi and restaurant Chinese. I mean, maybe it did mm-hmm. a little bit, but yeah, I never never mastered it to the point where I was ready to go chasing after classical Chinese. But I have learned just through this podcast, I've learned a reasonable amount about what classical Chinese is. Mm-hmm. Well, I I'd, I'd um, encountered a little bit in in poetry and sometimes street signs are in classical Chinese. There's classical Chinese everywhere. And um, yeah, I met a professor at the University of Victoria, Daniel Bryant, who was willing to do a one-on-one uh, reading course with me. And so we just read uh, classical Chinese for a year. And uh, he seemed to think I had more talent for that than uh, I, I would for naturopathic medicine. <laughs> and so I abandoned that plan and went to um, Toronto to do uh, a master's degree in Chinese poetry. And then um, I kept on going back and forth to Taiwan to see the, the woman I'm now married to. And um, master's in, in Chinese poetry, I finished this master's and I said, God, I can't imagine doing 
doing a PhD in, in Sinology, stuff that happened uh, 1,200 years ago. It seems so far away. And, and since I'd lived in Taiwan, it was part of my personal experience. I felt like I could relate to it more. So I thought I would do Taiwanese literature for my, for my PhD, which I eventually did. And um, meanwhile, I'd started working as, uh, as a translator. I got my first um, job after teaching English for a couple of years as translator of study documents. There are these um, organizations in Taiwan that uh, sell opportunities to young people to go abroad for, um, for further study. Um, often it's just to, to go and try to improve their English. They go to Spain or uh, places in Western Europe or England, Australia, North America. So they would come in and we would translate their um, study documents, reference letters, which they had re written themselves and um, their study plans in a kind of sweatshop. Um, well, I don't know if we had air conditioning or not. It, if, if we did have air conditioning, it didn't seem to work. And so we worked in these conditions um, and I did that for uh, about a year. And uh, through that, I, I started working as a freelancer. Um, and because um, I was an English native speaker, they just assumed that I, I knew stuff about, about uh, the uh, kinds of documents that they needed to translating. So they basically gave me anything regardless of whether I could understand or not, we did, um, I did some military translation, um, legal translation, pharmaceutical translation, technical translation. Taiwan uh, is really important in the semiconductor industry. So I did all mm. sorts of semiconductor uh, related documents. And if I didn't understand it, when I started translating it, I had to figure it out in a hurry. So um, I did that for a couple of years and um, all through my PhD and um, I also started a, a master's degree in translation in Taiwan at uh, NTNU, National Taiwan Normal University, and um, I did. I never finished. Uh, so I think that's called Yixue, like when you take a degree and uh, can't be bothered to finish it or uh, can't find the time or energy to do a thesis. I, I, so I abandoned my, my degree at NTNU, but I met um, a professor there who teaches uh, conference interpreting, she's still teaching conference interpreting, Michelle Wu, who uh, introduced me to the Taipei Chinese Pen. Oh, yep. They're a great organization. They, they started off doing mainly blue stuff in Taiwan's uh, political color coding, but nowadays they do basically anything. They do all sorts of different writers, and um, they've been really good to me uh, over the years. And um, uh, I think both uh, Michelle might my uh, conference interpreting teacher and the Taipei Chinese pen introduced me to Gray Tan. Um, oh, yes, I've heard of him. Tan Guanglei, uh, Uming Yi's uh, literary agent and uh, a lot of people's literary agent. Uh, who And he at the time, he was trying to um, get a sample uh, done for, for Fu Yenren to try to take it to uh, trade publishers. And so I think he asked Michelle if she was willing to do it. And uh, Michelle, Michelle said that uh, she was too busy and uh, why not uh, try Daryl Sturck, who was interested in indigenous people, because I'd done my PhD uh, dissertation on the representation of Taiwan's indigenous people in film and fiction. So uh, there's a lot of indigenous people and indigenous content in the novel. Michelle thought I might be a, a good fit. And then the Taipei Chinese pen arranged some sort of, um, not a conference, but maybe some sort of workshop. And they asked Gray to talk at this workshop, and they asked me to be his uh, discussant. So Gray gave a a wonderful 15 minute speech. And then I, I tried to say something <laughs> critical about the speech. And so I, I got the opportunity through the Taipei Chinese pen to meet Gray. And uh, the rest is kind of history. Um, we did the, uh, the sample for Fu Yenren, which is two chapters of the novel, chapters two and three. And very quickly, the, the, it attracted interest from book scouts and different publishers. Next thing I know it, it sold to uh, Harville Secker, and uh, a year later, I was on a, a world book tour <laughs> to promote the novel. And um, since then, since 2011, when I was working on the sample for Fu Yenren, I think I've done 10 or 12 uh, book length works. So uh, I guess about one a year, one or two uh, book length uh, translations a year. That's great. Um, I'm going to sidetrack us slightly. You mentioned doing work that was in Taiwan's political color coding blue. Now, my um, my knowledge of Taiwan is okay. It's all sort of secondhand. Um, so I think I know what you mean there. But for the listeners, could you explain that? And 
um, for, for me, could you explain how that maps onto Taiwanese literature? Because that sounds quite interesting. Okay, well, Taiwan's color coding is pretty uh, easy to understand. How that maps onto literature is a little bit more difficult. Off to think up some some good examples. I think I can think of some good examples of green and blue writers. Well, blue since uh, at least the late 1980s has uh, met the Kuomintang, the KMT. Yeah and other parties that have allied uh, with the KMT. It wasn't until 1986, I think, late in 1986, that um, the KMT lifted the ban on political party formation and uh, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, immediately formed. They um, had been organizing for um, at least half a decade, maybe longer, as uh, something called the Deng Wai. Um, outside the party, Deng Wai, literally outside the party. Mm. And um, for some reason, they got associated with the, the color green and the color coding is, is stuck. It still means basically the same thing today as it does, as it did rather in, uh, in the late 1980s. So um, green is, is DPP and uh, blue is KMT. And in terms of the goals of the party uh, or the party uh, platform. Uh, the KMT um, still thinks that uh, at some point in time, uh, reunification is, is going to be possible. Um, and uh, the DPP uh, hopes that at some time, point in time, um, Taiwan independence will, will be possible. And if you're close to the center, like if you're light blue or light green, you're just going to make do with the status quo. And um, most sane people for the past I guess, two or three decades, for as long as I've been uh, in Taiwan, um, same people have, have uh, been committed to the status quo. Um, but there's deep blue and, and deep green. So deep be- blue people would uh, favor um, more immediate uh, reunification and, and deep green <laughs> would like to declare uh, Taiwan independence. As for how that maps onto uh, Taiwan um, literature, it, it depends on the background of the writer. And if you were a mainlander, like if your parents were uh, from mainland China, or your, especially your dad was from mainland China, or you had been born in mainland China, you, you uh, at least early on, you were very likely to be uh, blue, to identify yourself as, as Chinese and uh, to hope for uh, Chinese unification. And if you were uh, native Taiwanese, if your um, ancestors had been in Taiwan for uh, decades, if not hundreds of years, then um, you were you were probably green and probably resented the uh, resented the um, the mainlanders for uh, monopolizing uh, political power in, in post war Taiwan. But since the 1980s, uh, with intermarriage, um, it's getting harder and harder p- to predict uh, what a person's uh, political affiliations are going to be based on <laughs> based on ancestry. You've got kids, uh, second and third de- generation mainlanders who are green. And uh, I don't think th- there are many native Taiwanese people that are that are blue, but maybe there are some out there. Can you think of any uh, writers that uh, are examples of blue or, or green writers? Well, off the top of my head, yes, drawing on uh, literally just this Taiwan season and books I've read for it. The last episode I did was on Taipei People by, oh dear, gonna Pai Pai Xianyong or Bai Xian. Bai Xianyong, yeah, he would be a blue writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think he's a blue, a deep blue. Uh, per, I don't think he has any crazy uh, political ideas or fantasies about about uh, immediate uh, reunification. That's a good example. An example of uh, a green writer would be somebody like uh, Song Zolai. In, in the 1980s, he was, um, he, he wrote a lot of pretty popular, um, successful uh, works of fiction. Then he was writing novels in Taiwanese, which there's no market for, like in the Taiwanese language. And uh, I can't remember whether he wrote them in, in Chinese characters or in uh, romanization, but, um, oh, right. and he was, he was also a, he was also a leftist. So uh, um, not, not extreme, but he was someone with strong uh, political uh, beliefs and uh, very much a, ta- a Taiwanese writer. Song Zolai from, from the 1980s. U Ming Yi, I think would also be a, a green writer, but maybe, maybe U Ming Yi would resent resent being uh, pigeonholed or being color-coded um, in, in that way. 
Yes. Um, yeah, Wu Mingyi, if you're listening and you're shaking with rage, um, please do get in touch on the podcast social media. <laughs> yeah. You can share your opinion to the listeners. Um, yeah. I'm going to keep the ball rolling here because we've, we've still not actually mentioned which book we're covering on this episode and which author. So um, you did leave some clues earlier on. You talked about um, homesickness, and that is the title of our book, although it is Home Space Sickness. And the author is uh, Lai Chaying. So first question how did you first come across him and his work that was also uh because of uh of Fuyan Ren. i mentioned the world tour to promote this novel it was just a north american tour but um we went halfway around the world and uh we went uh, twice actually once to uh, new york and toronto and the other time to montreal because in montreal every year they have a blue metropolis literary festival international literary festival that's organized by a writer and publisher called Linda Leaf. So, so Linda was uh, good enough to invite me and um, me to, to the festival to do some events and promote the novel. And I think it was all paid for by the Ministry of Culture in Taiwan. They've done a really good, a good job at promoting Taiwan literature and culture. So um, I met a couple of the uh, Chinese uh, speaking writers that Linda knew uh, the first was Xie Yiwei, uh, who's uh, from mainland China, and um, Xie Yiwei was looking for a translator and <laughs> to do the translation, and uh, that was way uh, outside of his budget and outside of Linda Leith's budget. Linda Leith uh, asked to uh, apply for funding from the Canadian government to be able to, to publish anything, mm. to pay the translator, so there's no way that there's no uh, going to pop up <laughs> so they could uh, get um, somebody that high profile to do the translation. So um, I just done Umi and uh, I didn't even know what the going rate for these things was and um, what they uh, were able to offer seemed fair and to me. And uh, I read a story by Xie Yiwei, a uh, taxi driver, it seemed okay. So I committed to doing that and I did another, um, I did a novel, uh, Dr. Bethune's children uh, for Xie Yiwei, uh, but I was always hoping to do a collection of short stories by Lai Zhiying. And we went out for dinner with Linda Leith and uh, Xie Yiwei, uh, Lai Zhiying, and, uh, and Wu Ming Yi, uh, I think in Chinatown in Montreal. So I kept in touch with Lai Zhiying uh, after that, and uh, he sent me a couple of his short stories, a couple of the, the stories in uh, the book that turned into Homesickness. The stories he sent me were the story that ended up uh, first, Red Dragonfly, and also Macaque Peach. Those are the two stories that uh, had either won awards or won uh, recognition. So I did those as samples, sent them to Linda, and uh, they got her attention, and she uh, she was willing to uh, publish the uh, the book, the collection of short stories, which Lai Zing had written had published uh, at the age of 27. He was about 35 by the time I finally met him, but um, he, he published the, the stories when he was very young. And um, the first two stories uh, that, I did the, that I did the sample of, uh, Red Dragonfly and Macaque Peach, really impressed me. And um, I kept on reading the other stories, and, and I liked the other stories more than the stories that he had selected uh, to represent the book. So... Um, uh, it was really a, a happy experience uh, translating uh, the stories and working with uh, Linda and uh, and working with the author too. Awesome. Next question. So I mentioned that speaking of renderings of names, it's important to note that the book's title in English translation isn't, like I said, homesickness, one word, but home space sickness. I'm guessing as translator, translator that was your decision. Is that right? Yeah, uh, homesickness was was my selection or my suggestion uh, for the title. I uh, I made another suggestion, what we which I'll mention a little bit later. The title in in Chinese was Ni Tao Zhe. Zhe is just the uh, morpheme that uh, turns a verb into a into a noun. Somebody who does something. Um, mm. What's an example? That's the Zhe character, right? Yeah, the Zhe character. What's an uh, example? Well, we did uh, one on the podcast called, uh, I think it was Tun Shi Zhe, so devourer. Right. Zhe, devourer. Devourer, or uh, Zuo Zhe is another, another good example, I think. 
Um, it's just somebody who does something. Mm. So uh, Ni is uh, kind of anonymous. Uh, Tao is somebody who is fleeing. Someone who is yeah. fleeing anonymously, an, anom- an anonymous fleer, um, <laughs> which didn't make sense to me uh, in any of the stories. There's no nobody in any of these stories that's fleeing anonymously. Mm. So, um, and... And anonymous fleer was not going to make a good title for no. a collection of short stories. So uh, when I was translating, I waited for inspiration to come. And as I said, inspiration came twice for, for the title of the collection. And um, homesickness came from the title of the last story, which in Chinese is Lu Xiang, uh, traveling in your homeland. So it uh, sounds like a contradiction in terms. So why would you travel at home, but I guess under COVID, we're all familiar with staycations. So mm-hmm. um, the idea is that he, you go away for uh, college and you come home and you feel like a traveler in the place that you grew up in, kind of like I felt when I went back to Canada. Maybe you felt the same when you came back from China? Um, well, I was going to say just through through lockdown or the latter end of UK's the UK's lockdown, or at least Scotland's lockdown, uh, I brought my girlfriend back to my home suburb in my hometown mm-hmm. of Dundee, and I was quite keen to show her like b- places that I had grown up or some of the nearby coastal towns and stuff. Right. So I guess that would be a little. We had some sessions of was it Yu Xiang traveling. Yu Xiang. Yu Xiang. Yeah. You had the same experience. I think so. Some of not for maybe not for some of the places that I would have been walking by as like a t- a, a, a 20 something but like we popped our nose into a sports center that i used to go to a lot in primary school which mm-hmm. is off the main road you have to like consciously make a choice to go in there and yeah that was um that did feel like i was the un- that was something uncanny that was um exploration in somewhere that should have been familiar and yet wasn't just because of time yeah it you think you, it should be familiar but it somehow seems strange Mm. and it freaks you out Mm -hmm. yeah um so uh traveling traveling home traveling home sounds like it indicates the journey to go home right yeah but uh lu xiang is traveling at home we're traveling in your homeland and i wasn't quite sure how to put that in in english and um all of the formulations that i i tried just didn't seem very good as titles right traveling at home (laughs) traveling through your homeland uh i mean they're fine for as as phrases in english but uh, not as titles of of a story so i thought of uh, homesickness because he when he goes to the to the city uh he feels homesick and he goes back home and and he, he feels sick at home so um homesickness as one word is is a familiar concept i wanted to uh, indicate um a combination of missing home and then uh, being sick of it when 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 you go home. So the title was supposed to be am- ambiguous. Right. Perfect. Um, the next section of our discussion I was going to move on to was deeper questioning about some of the stories. So we've chosen between us three stories in the book. Um, one of them is the titular story, Homesickness. So that works quite mm-hmm. nicely. Then we're going to do Scutigera. I think that is that. Scutigera, yeah. Scutigera. Okay, good. And quartet, last of all. But let's start right. with homesickness. Um, I'll try and summarize this one. And if you feel I've missed anything uh, once I'm done, feel free to fill in any gaps. This one I should do a decent job at because this one I read more recently than the other two. So mm-hmm. in homesick, sorry, yes, in homesickness, we have a second person narration, interestingly. Um, but I'll just assume that the reader isn't the main character. I'll assume the main character is a youngish man from uh, somewhere rural, I guess, in, in Taiwan, who's reminiscing about growing up in a, a property that his grandfather converted to a hotel. So it's kind of about his Bildungsroman, his like formation from kid to adult, But also you could probably just as easily say it's about his granddad or at least about his memories of his granddad and an image or a prop or whatever you call it that a lot of the story hangs on is a telephone. The granddad got a telephone installed in the building very, very early 
on in well when the first telephones were becoming available to ordinary people i guess and the telephone is still there at the end of the story and i think if i remember right our narrator concludes that he sort of never really knew his granddad he had a very important relationship with him but he never felt that he became him or anything uh, oh yeah it says here no one who hears the story would believe that you had nothing in common with him that's about all you know about him so it doesn't neatly tie the bow at the end of the story that would be my summary of it do you think there's any key things that we should also clue the listeners in on yeah um that sounds like a, a pretty good summary it's uh, as you mentioned about this guy's uh, relationship with his grandfather, which he didn't know, who, whom he didn't know very well, and also about obviously his relationship to, uh, to to home. He goes to the city, makes a new life, or imagines he can make a new life for himself, but he can't. Um, he can't forget. For, he can't forget where he came from and where uh, he grew up. And even though he he, he doesn't want to stay there. <laughs> And even though he, he hates the place, uh, uh, he, he's haunted by it. And I was going to mention that um, uh, homesickness or being sick of home is, works in, in Mandarin almost better than it does in English, because in English we have home and then family, mm. uh, two different words, right? But in Chinese, it's the same word, jia jia ren. Mm-hmm. Um, the connection between the people and the place is, is even stronger in Mandarin than it already is in English um semantically right um i just remembered i had some text highlighted in this story that i want to read to help me make a a slightly pretentious point um sure and i'm going to link back to a past episode as well to to help me um so it was in my episode on radish by mo yan have you have you read that one uh, no, Hong, no, no, no. What is it? Toming the Hong Luobo, I believe. Transpiring mm-hmm. Radish is literal translation. That's a, a story I loved. Uh, it's just a short novella or a long short story. And we're with following this little this lad. It's not clear how old he is, maybe like 10 or something, maybe a bit younger than that. And he's sort of roped into a work team somewhere in the countryside during like 50s or maybe early 60s China. So the building the new the new people's China sort of uh, era. And Mm -hmm. he doesn't really fit in because he basically sees more of reality than everyone else. He's super sensitive. Um, And there's amazing descriptions of tiny, minute auditory and visual details in nature. He's picking up that everybody who's busy, like turning nature into wells and roads and fields isn't picking up. And it rang really true to me of like my own memories of childhood when Like you're in your earliest memories, all the sort of sensory data or your picture of the world is a big mush because you've not really been normalized into existing yet. Your senses haven't been sort of streamlined into what they're supposed to be to function as a human being in society. And that's certainly not what this story is all about, but that was a thread that I latched onto and I highlighted some text that jumped out at me. So I'll I'll just read all of it. Um, first what you one. just said reminded me of the beginning of uh, James Joyce's uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Yeah, bingo. Yes. Yeah. Where exactly. he's hearing uh, what Catholics and Protestants, and he can't quite make sense of it uh, yet, but it's all somehow frightening. <laughs> That's funny. James Joyce yeah. has come up, I think, three times now in Taiwan season and never outside of Taiwan season on my podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so an, an invisible presence on the mainland, but inescapable at least on this podcast when it comes to taiwan Mm. Uh, anyway i'm gonna keep going you didn't know what a long time meant when you were young you just knew long to mean a great distance so that's a short one next one Mm. is longer in fact this is one big one i've got in two parts the moment you found the key you remembered the proud family tradition the ritual of learning to tell the time grandpa had taken you on his knee like he had taken your cousins like he would take your cousin's children. Dial 117, he had instructed. You did as you were told. The time is 423. The first time you heard the disembodied voice of time, you thought grandpa had conjured it up like a spirit medium. You didn't yet understand the ways of the world. You innocently trusted your sisters, your grandfather most of all. But it soon dawned on you that you could dial 117 on your own. 
you also realized that time proceeded with its unceasing regularity, no matter what your grandfather or any of the adults in your family did, no matter what anyone did. At that moment, the whole world started to change for you. You felt more anticipation than apprehension, but there was apprehension too. But as for what you were apprehensive about, at the time, you couldn't rightly say. And then there's a little um, asterisk here, and then the end of the story, which I'll just read as well, because it's so good. Having heard the story, every girlfriend says, wow, you and your grandfather were so close. You must miss him very much. You stay silent. Nobody who hears the story would believe that you had nothing in common with him. That's about all you know about him. The phone still clears its throat from time to time, but that burst of agitation will never again be followed by your grandfather's mumbled recollections, reminding you of the world before you had any sense of time or any knowledge of human affairs. So there you go. That's, um, that's, that's so up my alley. Um, it's a very strong note to end the story on, in my opinion. Uh, do you have nice, any a nice about- reading too. Yeah, and a good translation, of course. Um, so I should s- ask you first, does any of this grab at you as well? Or are you are your favorite parts of the story something different? Um, I'll share my favorite parts of the story in a second, but sure, it, it, it grabs me. And especially now that I've had kids myself, um, I don't know what I am to my daughter. Uh, a couple of years ago, I might've been her, uh, like a like a god. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm her, her hero uh, or uh, some kind of autocratic ruler that she's uh, starting to rip rebel against and uh, it takes a long time when when you're growing up for you to put your your elders in context your parents and and your grandparents so that was what i took away um from this part of the story in particular Mm. yeah i can i can relate i'm like i've said earlier i'm 28 now and i'm only just starting to understand what it would be like to have my parents as my friends I know some people mm-hmm. say that they go from being your god to your hero to your oppressor and then to your friend when you realize that they're yeah. just a person like you. Um, oh, that's yeah. something nice to aspire to. Uh-huh. Um, and yet, the, I mean, it's uh, kind of an anticlimactic uh, ending where he says that he never managed to get close to his, his grandfather. In that respect, it's uh, kind of a story about failure. Mm. Um, but after the, the Asterix or Star here, I, I thought it was um, partly uh, an attempt by the author to be humorous. <laughs> the ending, if you read, read it as a story of his failure to connect with uh, his grandfather, then it's a story of failure. But um, it also seemed, I, at least I thought it was humorous. that <laughs> He goes on and on and on about it. And then um, <laughs> <laughs> said, yeah, I, I barely knew anything about the guy and don't miss him. No. <laughs> Maybe he's in denial, but there are a number of other um, parts of the, or moments in the story that, that uh, seem screamingly funny to me. Yeah, for sure. He said that he's, uh, Light Zing told me that he'd written a, a comic novel and that if I translate something else by him, it would be that, uh, that comic novel. And this story, um, more than any of the other stories in the, in the, in the collection, was a serious uh, while, whilst, while also being funny. Okay, what did the Pogue say? That if uh, if you didn't try to make a joke about it, you might end up crying? Anyway, the first uh, funny bit I thought was uh, when he goes into the store with his grandfather and uh, his grandfather's going to buy him a, a toy. So they go into this toy store. Right, he, he goes into this store uh, with his grandfather to buy a toy. He points up at a, at a robot toy, uh, toy robot, extremely expensive. And the grandfather has, I don't know, uh, maybe bad eyesight. He, he thinks that he's pointing at the bubble ring <laughs> right by the, uh, the, uh, the toy robot. So, uh, and then the, the grandfather buys him the bubble ring and takes it home and, and brags to everybody about how understanding you are, what an understanding little boy or, or a little grandson uh, you were, because other, other kids might ask for the expensive toy. You were satisfied with the, uh, with the bubble ring. So I thought that was fun. And then uh, his uh, tanga, his, uh, I always get confused by the, the fam- familiar relationships, but uh, tanga is a paternal uh, cousin that's older than you are. Uh, mm-hmm. Tanga was in his 30s and had achieved some success in, in life with a staff of his own to order around. He had it all, a wife, a son to inherit his name, a car, and a house, and apparently more than one of each, <laughs> more than one wife and, and so forth. So um 
So that was funny. And I thought, I think when I'm reading or even watching something that has a bit of tragic drama and comedy, the, yeah, the drama, it's tragic comedy, yeah, that's, tragic that's comedy. Uh, the tragedy tends to drag me in more. Um, so yeah, I think you've unlocked for me a fruitful second reading of, of these stories. If I was to go back to them looking for the humor, because it's definitely there for sure. Um, I was going to ask you as well, what do you think of the use of second person in this story? I associate second person with Ling Shan, um, what's uh, Spirit Mountain, that right. won uh, Gaoxing Jin the, the Nobel Prize. And I, I, maybe it was a second person narration, maybe it was uh, just Gao, Gaoxing Jin. I couldn't make it through uh, Ling Shan. I found it really irritating. So um, and as a reader, does the second person seem irritating to you in, in this story? Um, I think uh, at first I thought this could get annoying, but as I read, it did not. So yeah, as f for an author to choose to use it, I think they need to have good reason. I don't really yeah. know what the reason was here, Yeah. Um, but I think that didn't harm the story too much. I think it still worked. It's a personal form of address. So in that sense, maybe that, maybe it was a good choice. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't my choice. It was, <laughs> It was Lai Zing's choice, and so uh, I can't speak for him, but um, um, as I said, usually second-person narration puts me off, uh, but in this case, it, it, uh, it, seemed, uh, it seemed to work. Um, I was just trying to put my thoughts together about this. The um, second person, like third person, is kind of introduces distance from the material. Like if, you, if you're I narr narrator, the only distance would be the the temporal distance between now the moment at which you're telling your story and and the 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 past whenever the story happened. But if you turn yourself in third person, then then that introduces distance and second person uh, does as well. But then second person is different from third person because in second person you can have an anonymous narrator. Uh, doesn't matter who this narrator is. They just they don't even have to have. Uh, access to knowledge about the story. You can just assume the narrator knows the story because that's what narrators do. They, they tell stories. But in second person, you got to wonder who this person is that's, that's talking to him mm -hmm. and, and telling the story in the second person. Is it, is it a family member? Uh, maybe one of his uh, aunts, maternal aunt, somebody with an ax to grind. Is he addressing himself in, in the second person uh, as a way of getting distance on, 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 on the trauma. I don't know. The effect to me is to make him seem passive <laughs> as a character. And that doesn't sound like uh, a, a good way to uh, approach a story to make your main character, your protagonist uh, seem passive. But that's the effect that it has for me, uh, especially in, in the scene where one, one of the funniest scenes I thought in, in the story is when he takes his girlfriend uh, up to the inn to uh to see this haunted room because in one of the rooms in the inn um this writer came and uh, to spend the night and ended up taking an overdose of amphetamines and he, he died in one of the rooms in the inn and then grand grandpa uh sealed the room so nobody uh could get in and uh, certainly no guests were staying there and he wanted to take your girlfriend to, to see the room the room was locked so he went over to the other side and uh to the to another building in the inn that had a window where you could look out uh, and then across the courtyard, you can look into the room in which this writer killed himself. And so you're in there uh, with your girlfriend getting hot and heavy and uh, grandpa walks in with, uh, <laughs> with uh, an older lady. Uh, one of them had white hair, but the, the older lady must've been in, in her sixties. I can't remember. So um, you're, you're there with, with your girlfriend and then grandpa is there with this, this uh, this older woman, and uh, you're looking at each other, and everyone's jaws has dropped, and uh, Grandpa sees what's going on. He sees that his grandson is there with his girlfriend, so he goes over, and what does he say? He puts his arm around the grandson's shoulders. I don't know what what's happened to the to the older lady that Grandpa's uh, brought home to have uh, to have sex with, but um, he Grandpa quietly walked to your side to counsel you telling you what to do step by step, sit down by her side, her side, in this case is uh, the girlfriend's side, hold her hand, touch her hair, put her, put your hand around her shoulder, kiss her cheek, let her feel your breath on her neck, tell her I'm your grandfather, <laughs> um, as if, as if this would help him, him, uh, whatever, uh, 
um, score a home run with his, his girlfriend. Then he left the room and closed the door. And uh, then slightly later on, he says that he felt like uh, grandpa's wind up doll, like an autonomous, uh, auto automaton. How, how do you pronounce that word? Automaton. Yeah, automaton. He said he felt like grandpa's creature, a, a wind up doll, uh, and top and a top automaton. <laughs> Fuck. Automaton, I think. Yes. Uh, automaton. Uh, just going through the motions. You did it just like grandpa had said. And when all was said and done, all you were left with was a sense of uh, desolation. It all happened too fast and so on and so forth. You didn't mm. get it. All you were certain of was that the man who lay on top of your girlfriend that night wasn't you. It was grandpa, figuratively speaking. <laughs> So, so that 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 scene especially uh, makes him seem passive, as does the the use of uh, second person narration. And uh, we've gone through a couple of theories about why the author would have chosen second person narration, but uh, to make him sound passive uh, is is my guess. Mm, yeah, I was just as you were as you were talking, I figured I was thinking like, what effect does it have on me, the reader? And I think a lot of sorts, a lot of second person stories I've read, just maybe just intuitively, I get the feeling that it's a authority figure sort of describing or summing up the character's life. So this hadn't occurred to me until I'd stopped to think about it. But maybe me as a reader, intuitively, I'm imagining something like uh, our main characters at the pearly gates and whichever angel is there is recounting him the story of his life often in a kind of kindly non-judgmental way because you I don't I don't get a feeling that there's much judgment in the story when the character does something good or something stupid but that's neither here nor there that's just um that's maybe just how I read things that are in second person some kind of a parental uh, voice kindly describing to their junior everything that they've done summing it all up right that's a, a consoling uh interpretation uh i like it <laughs> yeah consoling is a good word that's just it's the one i and should have used as i as i said the the story did not depress me in the end mm. and um right at the end of the passage that you read the for the phone still clears its throat from time to time but that burst of agitation will never again be followed by your grandfather's murmured recollection uh reminding you of the world before you had any sense of time or any knowledge of human affairs so so the end of the story could be uh, about his failure to connect with his grandfather, but it's also um, pretty clear that he's grown up, right? Yeah. yeah. He has figured out how, uh, how the world works and maybe, maybe found a place uh, for himself in it. So passive or not, uh, uh, I think it's a positive ending. Yeah, he got there in the end. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of getting there, let's get to the next story. So it's going to be Scutigera. Now, this one... I must admit, I read this one quite far back in time because I've been busy moving house and starting a new job. So I'll give a really basic summary and maybe you could um, help me out here. So our main character in Scutigera is a young woman, I believe, or youngish woman, I believe this time. And I think, again, she's having some memories of older relatives that have been triggered by an insect that she sees, a scutigera. Have I have I got that right, or have I completely muddled that up? That's the story, yeah. yeah. And it's um, the characters in in the story that she calls Grandma and Grandpa. The uh, scutigera, aka a, um, a house centipede. It's the house centipede uh, genus. Scutigera uh, is the house centipede uh, genus. In in Chinese, it's you yen. Yo yen, right? Okay. So uh, this this Yo Yen appears in the story. House Centipede appears in the story, and uh, it reminds her of uh, the characters that she calls Grandma and Grandpa. Right. So it's about like uh, homesickness. Uh, Scudagera, a transformation tale, is about this young woman's uh, relationship with uh, Grandpa and Grandma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to remember something. A lot of these stories, if I remember correctly, start with a a um a quote, um what do you call that an uh, an epigram, um, epigraph. Epi epigraph, epigraph. Yes, that's terrible. Yeah. I work in publishing. I should have known that. Um, just let me, I'm just the kind of mistake I would make. Yeah. Um, so the the poem at the beginning of Homesickness is uh, I really like it. I I hope you don't mind if I oh go for if it. I read yeah. it. Mist descending and rain on a deserted inn. 
so there's an in in the uh in the story mm. uh wilting the flowers on the shore screeching a francolin which is a kind of bird like a fence like a pheasant mm. uh, a traveler in a barge at a wharf no one's standing his heart rending the tide is out the water low the spring is ending so that's the uh epigraph for homesickness that one and really good. it's a traditional poem i think it's a tz, uh poem so variable line length and uh, but rhymed mm. and um he seems like a really uh, literary writer, but he's actually a microbiologist by training. And he uh, has described his specialization to me, and it's canola. He does stuff related to canola, interactions between uh, canola and, and different kinds of bacteria. And he's also done some research on extremophiles, uh, bacteria that live in extreme conditions like high pressure, high uh, acidity, uh, high temperature. So he's never studied uh, centipedes and, and millipedes, <laughs> but he um, goes on and on about centipedes and millipedes, in, particularly in this story. At the same time, he's uh, obviously extremely well read, like in a literary sense. He's read lots of different writers from, from all over the world. And the uh, epigraph at the beginning of this story, Scudigera Transformation Tale, goes uh, drinking in a cup the tea you poured, drinking with a cup from the tap of your fingertip, the chill of spring. And that's uh, by a modern Chinese poet in Taiwan called uh, Chen Li, I think. I'm not familiar with Chen Li. Anyway, it's a literary uh, quotation at the beginning of the story. So he's like, uh, have you heard of the two solitudes? Is that, um, is that the expression about uh, people that can combine scientific and, and humanities knowledge? I haven't heard that before, but that's great. Um, I can't remember. It was a, it's an English writer, C.P. Snow. I uh, was at mm. a party one time and uh, uh, somebody, w- some, some professor of humanities was complaining that uh, you scientists, you've, you've never read Hamlet or <laughs> you've never read such and such. And C.P. Snow said something. And C.P. Snow was a a pretty uh, prominent writer in his his day said something about well, have you have you um, have you spent time trying to understand the second law of thermodynamics or or, or something like that that uh, scientists and and uh, scholars in the humanities are often two solitudes they don't understand what the others uh, up to but people like CP Snow and and uh, Lai Zing, uh somehow able to do both they're both uh, literate really widely read and also uh, scientifically uh, literate or sci- knowledge about, uh, about science. So that's the kind of writer that, that uh, Lai Zing is. And uh, it's most apparent in, 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 this, in this story, Scudagera, in which he's quoting Chen Li, modern poetry from Taiwan, quoting all sorts of other stuff, traditional Chinese poetry, and uh, talking about uh, um, centipedes and, and millipedes. Shall we read the paragraph in which he introduces the... Uh, phylogeny of uh, millipedes and centipedes. Uh, Diplopoda and chylopoda are the main orders in the subphylum myriapoda. This is a sentence from the middle of the story. Uh, myri- myriapods have long bodies composed of uh, repeating segments. So it's, it's like from a science textbook. So yeah. what's it doing in the story? Who knows? Um, my only, my only take, take here would be that life and death, or at least mortality, seems to be a big thing in this story yeah that's right yeah that's you know that's a part of biology we're all living things all living things right, die, yeah. whether we're a scutigera or or a human and there is I, there is a bit i was going to quote here because i wonder if mortality is on the character's state of mind thinking of these elderly elderly relatives who if i remember right that's right passed away so i think near the start she hears a loud noise or something she's um at the beginning she's um she uh, she's trying to get to sleep, and uh, there's a millipede in her right. bed. And uh, I don't know if can millipedes bite. I don't know. She feels this millipede at the small of her back, and then uh, she thinks uh, she remembers uh, spending time at, at Grandpa's house, and Grandpa used to give her a back rub. So the feeling of the millipede on the back on her back uh, okay. reminds her of uh, Grandpa giving her a back rub, and she she has a dream about her Grandpa, and then she pees the bed. So she gets up and uh, puts the puts the millipede in uh, a vial, puts it on the windowsill. And the part that you just mentioned, where uh, she gets uh, poked, 
How did you just put it just now? Uh, she heard a loud noise. I think that's how I phrased it. Yeah, she heard a loud noise. She That's uh, another memory. She's walking to work and right. uh, walking along the, the, the alley. And she heard, hears a, a loud noise like a ping, like a thunder shower. And then she gets a sharp uh, pain in the neck. And she figures out that somebody has uh, shot her with a steel pellet or a BB gun. Mm-hmm. Somebody was using her for, for target practice. Yeah, very strange. So what's this doing in the novel? It's um, My theory is that uh, it reminds her of uh, the firing squads of the, of the White Terror, right. which might have come out in your podcast before. And in the 50s uh, and even 60s and 70s, even in the 80s, uh, the KMT were, was, was executing uh, political pr- prisoners. And uh, the main character of the story, Missy, um, associates Grandpa with the White Terror. She wonders if Grandpa is kindly old fellow that uh, has a has a, a, a collection of pet birds and just a nice old man. Whether he uh, might have been part of the of the White Terror, maybe he was uh, one of the executioners. He's from mainland China. He's a mainlander. So, so she wonders if uh, if her grandfather might have been an executioner. And uh, so she associates uh, people getting executed by firing a squad uh, with her own experience walking along the street and getting shot at by somebody with a, with a BB gun. Yeah. Um, this, this relates to like a, a feeling I had um, living in, in mainland China that real scary history was not so far in the past. So um, I, I live in yeah, Scotland. Within living memory. Within living memory. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so like I, I live in Scotland. That's where um, it's in this part of the UK that the last land battle was fought on British soil quite safely in the past in 1745 at Culloden. So no one's no one's got a granddad who remembers that. I guess yeah. <laughs> I've I've known plenty of people who were kids during World War II. Had grandparents yeah. who had to go to the countryside. Um, I had a neighbour who was in the RAF um, and was over in France for a while for that. But that's a world away from what so many people are just one or two generations away from in the mainland, China and Taiwan yeah. and lots of the world, really. Um, so like as a translator, um, do you think that's a challenge where like um, the Chinese language readers of the story might pick up on these more subtle things about mortality, the threat of death being so much more present, at least in right. living memory? Is that a, a difficult, subtle thing to transmit for you know, yeah. people in sheltered uh, parts of the world, like Brits and Canadians? Right. If I don't think we had a white terror in, in Canada, although the news coming out about the uh, residential schools is uh, is is pretty frightening. Um, mm. But yeah, if the if the reader doesn't have enough uh, of a background, uh, make the kind of associations that any Taiwanese reader uh, would make. At least Taiwanese readers that have been educated and are of a certain age, then um, it's just going to go over the the reader's head. So um, I tried to add. A bit of context that would help the reader make sense of it in the introduction. And I can't remember if I did in the story, but that's typically what I would do. Instead of a, a footnote, I would uh, add a little note in text to explain in, in really basic terms what, what the white terror was. And um, I think maybe 20 years ago, um, I would have done that less. I wasn't translating 20 years ago, but I imagine yeah. the literary translators are having to explain themselves less and less than they used to because of Wikipedia. Because now, if you mention white terror and the reader's interested, the, they can get far more information than you could ever give them in an in-text note or even in a in a footnote, um, just by entering in a couple words in, in Google. So sure. if the reader's uh, curious about it, uh, they can they can figure out what it's what it's all about on their own. I guess there's only so much you can do for a, a reader. The, the thing that you want is is a reader that's uh, motivated or or interested enough to go in and and uh, figure things out when when things don't quite make sense. For sure, yeah. I I find doing the podcast that I can also depend a lot on the sort of the new milieu that the publishers and translators are working in. So like uh, Taipei people, that that was a product of. Uh, or published by the Columbia University Press, the translation of Taipei Ren. And you could kind of tell it was translated by academics, maybe not necessarily for academics, but for an academic press. So yeah, um, lots of... Very press, kind of literal. Yeah, quite, lit, quite literal. And 
preserving certain key terms and yeah uh, it wasn't a, a criticism i had but i kind of felt okay this is all right for me but the average guy on the street might get might really know might not know what they're walking into if they picked up this I, book versus um, an issue i thought a lot yeah. about and i hope we can talk about it a little bit for uh, sure. later on i thought that uh that Bai Shenyong participated in the translation of um, of Taipei Taipei people. Wasn't he the co-translator? I didn't see that, but I would I would believe it. Yeah, because and his English is really good. He was mm. in um, he's been in uh, Santa Barbara for for decades and well, course, yeah. uh, taught taught university taught, taught college at uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, for for decades. He's now retired, but um, I, I'm sure he could translate it in English. On, on its own, <laughs> maybe it, it it would be helpful to for him to work with a, a literary translator as a native speaker of English. But um, maybe maybe part partly it's it's so literal because of uh, because he was in because the author was involved in translating it. Yeah, that would make sense as well. Uh, but then again, he's been in the U.S. so long. You could equally make predictions in the other direction. But who knows? Mm-hmm. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read a paragraph here. Go for it. It's the sentence that I, I read before, uh, or the two sentences. Mer- millipedes and centipedes, diplopoda and chylopoda are the mer- main orders in a sub in subphylum myriapoda. So like something from a science textbook. Uh, myriapods uh, have long bodies composed of repeating segments and so on and so forth. And so what's this doing in the story? How does it make sense in the story? Well, her, um, her ex-boyfriend was a... Uh, Entomology major. I hope I've said that right. And sometimes I, I'll I get it confused with etymology. It's entomology, isn't it? I don't know. Entomology. Someone who studies bugs. Right. Her her ex boyfriend studied bugs in um, in university. So you can imagine the ex boyfriend telling her all about bugs, right? So there's there's a you could you could rationalize uh, these kind of sentences from science textbook appearing in the story. So why did they appear in the story though? That has to make sense in the story. So I think it's it's certainly about um, mortality, as you mentioned, but also about human relationships in the last uh, paragraph on page 161. If only human relationships were as easy to explain as the phylogenetic relations between species and phylogenetic uh, is uh, what? Qinyuan guanxi, Qinyuan guanxi. And, and uh, the author corrected that. I, I think I'd said evolutionary relationships. He corrected that to phylogenetic relationships. Phylogenetic right. relationships is basically just evolutionary relationships. How uh, different species have uh, been produced through the, the through the process of evolution. All right. So if only human relationships were as easy to explain as phyl- phylogenetic relations between species with people, it's impossible to predict who you're going to take after or feel close to. Oftentimes, water is thicker than blood, and I thought that water is thicker than blood was brilliant when I when I came up with it. Do you do you like it? No, that is good. I'm whenever I come across a clever turn of phrase in translated lit, it almost makes me wonder what was the source language, and um, was it also a clever yeah. turn of phrase? And I I completely rewrote that the end of that paragraph uh, with permission from the author. Mm. But the fu- the funny thing was, is I said uh, water is thicker than blood, and I, I sent that to the author. And he thought uh, that I just made it made a mistake. <laughs> I'd meant to write blood is thicker than water, but I'd, I'd misremembered it and uh, and switched it around. But the point I was trying to make here was that uh, how you feel about other people is not the degree of whatever phylogenetic uh, relatedness you, you have to them. It's not how closely you're related by blood. Mm. Um, emotional connections to people, like that's how we feel about our girlfriends or our or our wives, we're not related to them by blood, but we feel extremely um, strongly about them. Yeah, I suppose there's a you, there's a cause and effect that's hard to untangle there because often we we feel strongly about the people we're closely related to, but that's because yeah. those are the people we live with. Or, or who that's right. Roughly. That's right. That that's the whole point. And um, the point in, in this story is that grandma and grandpa are not her real grandma and grandpa. Yeah, she's Taiwanese, and grandma and grandpa are from Hunan. Uh, they're mainlanders. So they mm-hmm. came over with Chiang Kai-shek after he lost the Second World War in 1949 and 1950. And then they ended up live, living in a Jianfen, a, a veteran's village. And uh, they were babysitters for the main character when she was growing up. But she ended up feeling closer to them than she does to her, her own family. She seems a very lonely person 
uh, in the story. Because now grandma and grandpa are gone by the end of the story. And uh, she's living in this apartment by herself. Uh, doesn't seem to have any contact with her with her family, but can't get over uh, this uh, this couple, grandma, grandpa, or not her real grandma, grandpa, that took care of her when she was when she was young. And I I found um, her recollections of of grandpa in particular very touching. Uh, when I when you translate, sometimes it gets into your guts. The the story gets into your guts, and uh, you, you respond how the the writer is hoping you'll respond and it's not a tearjerker, but uh, there are a couple of moments in here where I always get worked up. Like I'd, mm. I'd be, uh, I'd be revising it for the 10th time or, or whatever. And, uh, and I, I would tear up at the right moment in the story. So, so when that happens, I, I, I usually felt that I, I guess the translation was doing, was doing its job. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it's about, about people's relationships with uh, people they're not related to which is uh, a pretty big topic. Yeah, that came up um, in another story we looked at. Um, and I'll, I'll jump to that in a minute. But I was just going to say, I can relate to this a lot because I'm a kid of uh, divorced parents. So I have, um, yeah. there's a fairly large branch of people I would consider my family who I have zero blood relations with. But yeah. um, it has come to mean that lack of um, genetic relationship has come to mean very little. Although I didn't know them for maybe like the first 10 years of my life, that branch of the family is just as much family, really. It's like I have a, like I have grandparents in that family side of the family. I would never really call them step grandparents. I have a sister who's technically a half sister. I would never bother using the half part. It, it's it's uh, it's rendered meaningless by the the emotional connections. So that right. just She's rings. Just a sister. Yeah, exactly. It rings really true. Um, was I going to say? Yes. And yeah, there's another story we looked at, which looks at um, uh, an, a sort of a stepfather figure, but it's a much darker, more difficult relationship. So I, would, I don't want to ask you specifically about that, but I would like to ask you, since I'll, I'll confess to readers here, I've not read the whole book. I've just read a selection of stories that we've I've covered for the episode. So I'd like to ask you, Daryl, is that a theme through the whole book? Um, sort of family that isn't technically family? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good take on it. Sure, that's right. one of the themes that run through runs through the uh, the book. It's it's about people's love hate relationships with uh, with home, the people one grew up with, and the people one um, spends one one's time with. I mean, there couldn't be any bigger theme than that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's life in a nutshell, I guess. It's um, I mean, it's a collection of short stories, and so you wonder what's the what's the common thread. And uh, homesickness is a really really big theme right um in um in james joyce in dubliners the the theme is supposed to be paralysis right when i took the novel in university that's what the professor said and that seemed to make sense i think even one of the stories is called paralysis or maybe the the first story is about an invalid right i've not read it so i'll just trust you on that one okay well um paralysis so as people are unable to make changes in in their lives uh, maybe because of the deadlock between Protestants and, and uh, Catholics in, in Ireland. So it's easier to s- say what the kind of common thread is in the stories in, in, in Dubliners and maybe also Taipei people. But in, in homesickness, um, I'd be hard pressed to say uh, that there's a single theme or single idea that's uh, being explored in, in different ways in all the different stories. But, right. but your theory, your theory makes sense. It's about uh, our love hate relationship with, with people that are related to, and also people that we're not related to. All right, cool. I'm loving that James Joyce has found his way in yet again. Good for him. Uh, in, in Taiwan literary studies, it's, there's a book about, uh, about, about Ireland. And you can imagine that green um, writers and meaning people uh, that identify as Taiwanese and yeah. uh, would might identify with uh with ireland and i mean taiwanese writers might identify with with irish writers given the relationship between ireland and england totally as a kind of metaphor for relationship between taiwan and china yeah that makes a huge amount of sense and helps that ireland is is an island although i guess the difference is ireland has that difficult part northern northern ireland which is yeah that's right that's uh what in taiwan the uh taipei is very blue Right. Where Lightsing grew up is is a pretty uh, usually votes votes KMT. 
Right. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I On um, the last episode uh, on Taipei People with uh, Nadia Ho, I, I'm glad she I'm glad she didn't uh, find it irritating, but I kept bringing up um, Scotland for, for similar reasons because of the, mm. pa- the parallels. Certainly not yeah. a perfect analogy, but it's quite fruitful. If you if you can accept a little bit of playfulness, it's a fruitful sort sure. of comparison. Yeah. There's a, a book called uh, Hang Xiang Ireland in, in Taiwan, academic book, that's just basically about uh, Taiwanese writers or Taiwanese academics identifying Taiwan with Ireland or hmm. um, Taiwanese writers with, uh, with Irish, Irish writers. That's fascinating. And developing a nationalism in the shadow of a much stronger nation. So I, I think, yeah, the, if you're p- playful and you, you can, um, you, you can uh, tolerate uh, differences in your comparison, right? Every, every kind of comparison involves contrast. Mm-hmm. But uh, certainly, certainly, uh, a lot of uh, Taiwanese uh, people have uh, compared Taiwan to, to to Ireland. I'm sure there are also st- strong parallels with with Scotland too. Yeah. Do you know if anyone's planning to translate that? Because I I would kill to read that book. Hangxiang Ireland. I, it's an academic book. I don't think uh, there would be a. No. I don't think there'd be an, a a market. Oh well, uh, better learn <laughs> Chinese then. Speaking of being out of practice, I think I said I would revise what I'd written for this question, but didn't, Mm because I was going to ask you if you wanted to compare this to a story by Huang Fan, The Intelligent Man, which you told me Mm -hmm. you hadn't read, and I have not revised the question, so apologies. But what I'll try and do is I'll try and summarize them both, and then that should help you see what I mean. So in Quartet, again, I read this one the same time I read Scutigera, so my memory has some of the, the those memories have departed from me but we have a, a story told first person by an older woman uh, narrator this time and she's looking back on a career well not just a career but her life uh, and loves doing uh, working in music i think in academia but at least she uh, as a musician as a taiwan as a taiwanese person who's gone to america so i guess a taiwanese american and yeah. she has romantic and emotional ties with two different men who I guess I think are both Taiwanese who who have moved to America so Taiwanese Americans and I this is where my memory fails me exactly how to differentiate the two men I think one is sort of the ideal choice one is the pragmatic choice sort of a thing yeah there's some twists and turns she's studying um piano at uh a a big university on the east coast Mm. of these East Coast of the United States. I'm not sure what what city she's in or what university it is, but she goes there on a on a government scholarship to study piano. And uh, these scholarships are such that you have to finish the degree uh, f- to get the scholarship. If you don't finish the degree, you have to pay it back. Right. And so she goes there, and it's a lot of money uh, in those days for for poor people in Taiwan. Uh, just going to the U.S. to take a, a degree in, in piano was just Tianwen suits. It was just a lot of money. So you could only do it if you got this government government grant. So she goes there, she's taking piano and she falls in love with this, another poor fellow who's also there on uh, on a scholarship from uh, British Malay at the time. He's from uh, Butterworth, I think. It's across the, across the water, across the strait from Penang, from the island right. of Penang. But now a bridge, but at the time you had to take a ferry. So he's from Butterworth and uh, he's a, a young Chinese fellow who is... Uh, is also studying piano. Uh, one day they they're practicing and uh, they don't have their own pianos, right? They're too poor to afford piano, so they're they're practicing in the in the practice room of the university, and they're right next door to one another. And they hear that right next door the the person is is practicing the same thing, and so they start playing. One hand plays the one part, and then in the next room the the other person plays the other part with the other hand. So they play a duet in, in two separate rooms. They come out and and see see who it is I, I never expected it would be you and they they basically fall in love at at uh at second sight that's their second uh, meeting so they fall in love and um then uh later on uh the girl from taiwan uh gets uh gets sick what does she come down with i'm um, not sure uh rheumatoid arthritis she gets sick with uh, rheumatoid arthritis right and it's so bad and it's it's wild the uh it's while the while the young man from uh, Malaya is away at a competition in Japan, and then he goes home back home to to Malaya. So she gets sick with um, rheumatoid arthritis, and then there's another Taiwanese fellow there who's taking a doctorate in computer science, and he's 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 wealthy, like his parents are 
are rich. And so he offers to marry this girl with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and uh, she has no choice but, but to say yes, because she couldn't afford, she's not going to be able to finish her degree and she could not afford to pay back the, the scholarship. So it, she accepts this fellow that she doesn't love's uh, marriage proposal, gets married to him. And so why does he ask her to marry him? Because um, he's fallen in love with his best friend's wife. And uh, he has to, to, to prove to his best friend that uh, he has to give the appearance to his best friend that uh, he, 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 he has his own woman and uh, he's not involved with the best friend's wife. He gets, he gets married for the wrong reason, obviously, yep. to deflect his, his friend's uh, attention. The friend suspects that uh, he's having an affair with his wife, which he is. <laughs> continues to have an affair with his wife throughout the story. Um, so um, she marries this, this, uh, this wealthy fellow from Taiwan and not the, the boy that she actually loves. So I was going to ask about the intelligent man in this story. And to sum up the intelligent man, it's, it's less subtle and intricate, I would say. It's more sort of cartoonishly, satirically structured. So in the intelligent man, we have a, a, another Taiwanese person a man who goes off to america to um i don't think he's going for academic reasons i believe he's going for business reasons but uh, yeah i think i think what it is is in in taiwan he has a wife he goes over to the states and i think possibly marries again or or ends up with a mistress in the states um his business in the sort of taiwanese american community starts to dry up so he goes to uh, the prc which is beginning to open up its uh, economy and so on and he gets involved working with, a, I think, possibly a state-owned enterprise or something there. And he ends mm. up having a, a, an affair with a secretary or something from some one of the mainland provinces. And just as things are getting more nuts, he and everything's falling apart. He goes to Singapore, ends up with another mistress, and it ends with an absurd uh, conclusion where all the mistresses are having uh, like a big joint meeting with him and having him sort of work out who gets what. So the two common threads there being going to America, Taiwanese Americans and affairs, and I guess also professional life. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, do, do you see anything in the confluence of those themes that is worth uh, analyzing a bit? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so as I, as, as I said, or you said, um, the, the husband of this, uh, of the protagonist, the one who gets uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ha has uh, an affair with the wife of his his best friend, but then the best friend dies, <laughs> so leaving a young widow behind. And and they continue to have an affair throughout the story. So the quartet is um, the the main character is from Tour Arthritis, the young man from British Malaya, a uh, fellow piano student, also poor, a uh, husband of the girl with rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, the husband's lover. Um, the widow of uh, his best friend. So that's why the story is, is called Quartet. And it's just about, I guess, their life courses. Is that, is that a word? It works, it works, I guess. Life courses, the course of their lives. Life courses of um, Chinese people in, in, I don't know if they're expatriates, but uh, overseas Chinese, people yeah. in the overseas uh, uh, community. So life courses will cross and maybe get, uh, I don't know, knitted together or sewn together or whatever the metaphor is so uh, life courses cross and people's lives get uh, get um, interwoven woven into uh into i guess uh, some sort of textile and so that's it the um the story is it seems to me it's 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 not overtly political um like the story by by huang fan seems like it's it's a commentary on business and politics in in the chinese uh, expatriate community or the overseas Chinese community, and then in in cultural China in places like China and, and, and Singapore. There's there's certainly some ideological things that come up when he goes to the PRC. It's a commentary on politics and and the changing economic economic and political situation. Yeah, I think economics is work works a little better when he's in the states. He gets into an interesting business. He's producing or importing. I think producing Taiwanese style furniture or at least Chinese style furniture right. for the Taiwanese uh, living in the States because they have homesickness and 
the yeah. American economy isn't producing that for them. Um, right. So yeah, there's some there's some politics and there's some economics in there, definitely. Right, and sounds from your description of the story, it sounds like he's an opportunist, right? So yes, yeah, exactly. He's from but, Taiwan, but I mean, there's it's not business opportunities in, in China, so we'll go to China, we'll go to go to Singapore. Um, mm-hmm. uh, does does he have strong principles, political principles, or is he just basically? Well, I think that's why himself afloat as a businessman. Yeah, I think that's why the the title, the intelligent man, is um, definitely. All right, he's intelligent, but it's ironic. It's yeah, it's intelligent with quote marks on it. No principles. Yeah. So when 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 you asked the question about the the story, and I was trying to put my thoughts together about the story for the for the podcast, um, I thought about other works of uh, of literature about uh, the overseas Chinese community in the states, and what came to mind is really political stuff, overtly political stuff, like Zhang Xiguo who wrote uh, The Chess Master um, and uh, Liu Darun. Uh, and both of them wrote novels about Diao uh, Yutai uh, Dong, about Diao Yundong. So uh, the, uh, the Diao Yutais are this island chain that uh, oh, yes. Japan claims and uh, PRC claims and, and Taiwan claims. Everyone claims uh, this, the, these islands and um, Japan has control over them. So it's, it's a huge nationalist uh, issue. And uh, in 1971, um, the islands were awarded by some international organization or perhaps by the states, I can't remember, uh, to Japan. And so uh, Chinese intellectuals were up in arms and there was this huge movement in, uh, the, in, in, in the states called Bao Diao Yundong. And there were leftists Bao, in Bao Diao Yundong and, uh, and rightists, conservatives, uh, former president of uh, Taiwan, what's his name, Ma Zhou, was a conservative or rightist uh, leader in the Bao Diao. Uh, Yun Dong, and he, I think he might even have written his PhD on, on uh, the, uh, the sovereignty of, of the Diao Yutai uh, Islands. So there, there are a couple of, of novels about, about this movement, uh, explicitly political. Um, this story quartet that we're talking about here is not explicitly political. There's a mention of uh, the situation in the, in the Taiwan Strait, um, the maintaining the status quo and it's an awkward situation, but you can't talk about it. And uh, you just hope that uh, you don't have to talk about it, that you can maintain the status quo. But that's basically the only political reference in the story. The story mainly seems to be about the personal lives and life courses of these uh, members of the overseas Chinese community. And but that's not the reason I like it. The reason I like it is it's ultra romantic. I, I don't think I've read a story uh, that is more romantic than than this one. Did did you uh, did you find that as well? Um, it's this I'm... tragically romantic story that uh, because when when her 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 actual love uh, the the guy from uh, British Malaya is back home in Malaya, he uh, he gets his eyes put out. He's driving past right. on a scooter past uh, a Malay village one time, and he runs over a chicken. And so the, the villagers grab him and, and beat him up and uh, put out his eyes. <laughs> so it's just horrible. It's a, it's a, it's a tragic. Um, that, that episode, at least, is, is tragic. And because of that, he, he can't get back in, in, in touch with the girl that he loves. And she's now married this other guy. He, he doesn't feel at home anymore. So he goes back to the States and he works as a piano tuner for, for 20 years, blind piano tuner. And then one day... Uh, the the girl's husband asked him to go over to to, to their house to tune the to tune the uh, the piano that he's bought her, and that's the reunion. So uh, the girl is now 50 years old with rheumatoid arthritis and badly disfigured, and the boy is now um, is now a piano tuner. Neither of them have been able to have a, a career in in piano. Uh, they're both kind of uh, failures, but they, they get reunited and uh, they manage to kind of continue their love affair without consummating it physically uh, by, by making music, by music, making music together. And uh, so it's just ultra romantic is how I would describe it. And I found a, an example, if you don't mind, uh, mm. at the end of the, the story, because um, he, he's from British Malaya and he sweats a lot. And that's a kind of it's mentioned a couple of times in the story, even though uh, it's not quite so hot uh, in the East Coast of, uh, of the United States. He's always sweating constantly because he's because he's from Malaya. That's the explanation of the of the main character, the girl. And so she says, um, 
if you could, you would collect an entire lake of his sweat and drown yourself in it. <laughs> she would drown, him, drown herself in, in a lake of, of his sweat. Ultra romantic. At the end of the story, they've been reunited. They're making music together. And she's been planning a, a kind of a love, love, love death. A love suicide. What, what's the what's the expression for that? Oh, I think yeah, for lovers everything, suicide. Everything. Your relationship with this with this person is more important than life. You'd rather die together. What did you say? Sorry. A lover's suicide. I was just trying to think. A lover's lover. suicide. She's been planning with lover's suicide. So if she could, she would collect an entire lake of his sweat and drown herself in it. Ultra romantic. Yeah, and sticky. And sticky. <laughs> yeah. I think a figure that's come up on the show a lot is the um, the failed scholar. So the person mm. who is a natu- natural sort of literati, but was just never quite good enough where the stars didn't align and they couldn't pass the imperial examinations and so on. That right, kind of yeah. a character we had on uh, IP People, but just through the podcast, that's, a, that's one of my favorite sort of stock characters in Chinese lit. Right. And I guess in the modern world, it's not so hard, or at least there is a pathway where you can go and do that in academia, maybe not so easy in creative writing. But for people who want to be artists in our capitalist economy, you not everyone can do it. Um, it's yeah. There's not enough funding there or not enough um, paths to a career. There's only so much attention to go around. Exactly. Yeah. So it, I, I think there's another level to the romance there, even further removed from like the world of affairs. And that's finding joy in music for its own sake without Mm -hmm. chasing success like the characters were doing early on and yeah that that speaks to me a lot who am i to say that they're that they're failures exactly yeah failure is a subjective term we'll have to figure out what the what that quotation from the pogues is but what what does uh tom cruise say in uh, risky business i wish i knew (laughs) Uh, sometimes you gotta say what the fuck it's uh but i was trying to think of uh something that expresses the notion that, I mean, who really cares what other people think of, of how your life has gone? I mean, nobody cares really. Yeah, no um, one's keeping score. Nobody cares if you're a best-selling uh, writer. Nobody cares if you're published. I mean, the thing that matters is if you think that you're a writer and if, uh, like, if you think you've, you've done what you want to in, in whatever you've written, I mean, that's, that's all that counts ultimately. Yeah. The trick is being honest with yourself, I guess. Have you published any of your own stories, Angus? Um, yeah, some, I've had some stories put out in print and digitally, just a patchwork really. Um, so that the, the thing is one being deciding whether I'm happy or not with the patchwork and two deciding if I want to find the time to do more because I'm at an age now where I do have to find the time, not an undergrad anymore. Yeah, you got your job. Well, I yeah. would like to read the story about the guy going across the bridge and, and then, uh, seeing the, the S- SOS phone. Oh yeah, uh, that has that been published? Just self-published. Um, okay, but it is out there. Well, let me know where I can find it. Okay, I will. I will do that um, to avoid crass advertising. I'll do that after we're done recording. <laughs> okay. Right. So that's that's quartet. Are you ready to go on to the next set of questions now? Sure. Yeah. All right. Cool. So this is the the miscellaneous section, aka the fun section. Uh, so first one is the word of the day. The question is always worded: Can you suggest a Chinese word of the day? But Thai, I guess we can say Taiwanese word of the day as well, if that fits better. Mm. So it says also the question is worded for this story. That's not very helpful because we've just talked about three stories. So any word yeah. of the day that could represent either the book as a whole or maybe one of the stories we've looked at. Um, have you got any ideas? Yeah. Well, uh, just uh, phy- phylogeny came came to mind. <laughs> Qin Yun. Qin is Qin Shi, like your relatives, right. and Yuan is the source, right? With the uh, three, the San Yin Shui uh, radical, right? Okay. Origin or source, like where, uh, where the different species come from? Okay, I'm going to put this one in the chat to make sure I've got the characters right. Qin Yuan Guan Xi, I can send it to you after. That's ph- phylogeny. One of the findings of uh, of uh, biology in the past twenty years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is that um, species, the, the concept of a species is uh, not as stable as it probably seemed to, to Charles Darwin or to Linnaeus. What is the species anyway? There are different attempts to, to define it in terms of the ability to breed. And, but um, the problem is if, if you get like two individuals, maybe they might be able to mate, 
successfully A and B, and then B mates with C, and they can meet mate successfully, but then A can't mate with C. So uh, A and B are close enough together, they can mate successfully. B and C are close enough together, they can mate successfully, but A, A, and, um, A and C are no longer close enough. So A and B are part of the same species by that definition. If you can mate successfully, then you must be part of the same species. B and C must be part of the same species by the same definition, but A and C aren't. So, so long and short of it is that uh, the concept of, of species is, is, is unstable. And ultimately, it's just uh, the kinds of relationships that are meaningful to us, uh, parental relationships. That's ultimately all that a, a species is, is a huge, huge, huge family tree. And that the, 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 the family tree of, of a species is just part of the, 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 the giant tree of life. Because um, I, as I said at the beginning, I've, I've been herping a lot and like looking at, at uh reptiles and uh, amphibians with my daughter at night and uh, dragonflies and, and plants. So I, I, this, this kind of stuff has been on my mind a lot. So when I was translating this novel and especially Scudigira translation tale, it seemed apropos. Qin and Guanxi phylogenetic relationship, but it's not a really Taiwanese word, is it? It's quite a scientific word, but it, no, that's okay. It's a scientific word. Yeah, no, is that there, works. Uh, is there any Taiwanese word that, uh, other than that, uh, the only thing that came to mind was why Jiu, uh, nostalgia. Okay. Jiu is uh, the past, and why is uh, why is in in your bosom when you keep the past in your bosom? <laughs> mm. That's nostalgia. Why Jiu? So yeah, I mean. The novel is partly is partly nostalgia, but I guess it's about making meaning of the past, the past being meaningful for who we are today. So it doesn't have to be like you're obsessed with the past or can't look, let go of the past or anything like that. Uh, understanding yourself partly by uh, by where you came from. Right, that's that's great because that ties in quite nicely with the um, uh, the last episode, Taipei People. That was. Um, mm-hmm. The pros, a lot of the pros and cons, or the joys and the errors of uh, nostalgia. That's great. And what you I, said there about how the the category of species is helpful, but also not helpful at capturing the nature of it's reality. unstable. Yeah, unstable. Yeah. That's great as well because um, I think this is just my own my own interest I impose on the show. But I love the idea of um, literature or fiction that tries to get past or raise or at least point it to call attention to the fact that we all we have all these categories and words and frameworks that are supposed to capture reality but really mm. they're capturing our social understanding of reality and there is a much mm. crazier infinitely analog ungraspable network right. <laughs> underneath that you can't get to through science yeah or it sounds very Buddhist. Science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's all convenient means. We have these uh, uh-huh. concepts for, which are useful there, and they have some relationship to the truth, but uh, they aren't the truth. Yeah. As for what the truth is, well, all we have is these uh, convenient means, fang bian, that uh, are our best approximation of, of the way things are. Yeah. I went through a big Buddhist phase when I was about, uh, when I was trying to find myself in my late 20s and uh, early, early 30s. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer in this Buddhist phase, but I, I remember it fondly. <laughs> uh-huh. Did it, did it um, bear fruit? Well, I mean, my best friends now, uh, it's kind of awkward, I guess, for, to, for me to, to, to tell you who my best friends are at different phases of my life on the podcast. But um, the people I'm in closest contact now are people that I met in a class I took in Buddhism mm. and uh, Zhuangzi uh, with a professor called Leonard Priestley at University of Toronto. Uh, I'm in daily communication with these guys, and uh, we started out in this course in Taoism and, and uh, uh, Mahayana, Mahayana Buddhism, talking about convenient means, conventional designations all day long. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so it was a good, a good thing to learn about, and it became a, became a part, it's part of my life somehow, sure. Awesome. Well, I didn't see that topic um, coming, but I'm glad we hit on it because I'd never thought of those uh, of of that that um, I was thinking of it as um, Kantian. There's a word I've never used on the show before. Yeah. His idea of the, the noumena being the reality that you you just don't have direct access to. But yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Now you mention it. Yes, of course that would make some kind of sense from a Buddhist 
point of view as well. I, meant, I, I went through another phase uh, being interested in Steven Pinker and um, oh, yeah. and uh, ling linguistics and um, uh, neuroscience. Is it called neuroscience? Science of the of yep. the of the brain yep. and the mind. And um, so I guess the Kantian the Kantian take would be that uh, any experience that we have is is already informed by by categories we're not aware of like like the category of time and space is just imposed on our in our experience yeah. and that's all we have right we we don't have direct perception of 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 anything i mean there's this this white cup here sitting here i know it's a white cup it's easier for me it's easy for me to say white cup as for what the reality of the thing is it's 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 filtered through my sensory sensory perceptions and my knowledge it all subconsciously or unconsciously, I white cup. The words "white cup" appear in my mind somehow, and I guess neuroscience is, is the the study of how how this happens. Yeah, and not not to um, <laughs> not to sound too um, like I'm smelling my own farts here, but um, mm. a nice thing I think about being well, learning whether you're ever going to master the whole thing or not, but having awareness and some knowledge of other languages, especially ones which are total in a very different place on the family the language family tree yeah. even if they're on the same tree like english and chinese is you realize these concepts you know they weren't handed to us by god another language might have one for one words like what cup and beza but other times yeah. the differences are overlappings in languages like you were saying family home and jia or colors i find colors chinese and english color names really interesting because yeah, yeah. some stuff overlaps other stuff makes you realize oh wait these are just sort of habits and conventions. Yeah, and then you're right. You can't. You can't take. You can't take the way uh, people process reality in in your mother tongue for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was one of the greatest great experiences of my life, uh, learning Chinese to the point where where I realized shit. Uh, <laughs> whatever justice, whatever uh, cup, anything that uh, it's not always easy to translate these seamlessly. And uh, people just kind of process process reality into different terms in, in different languages. Yeah. So in a way, it's it's a perverse... It's a great thing to learn. Mm -hmm. It's a perverse sort of gift in a way that there are languages that aren't on the same tree in a way mm -hmm. that things, whether they've avert, they've um, converged in their evolution or they're parallel or whether they're, um, they've, they're totally in a different sort of... Um, yeah. Things are framed differently. We're lucky to have it because it gives us that POV that like... English and French, English and German translation just probably wouldn't give you for the most part. Right. right. They seem too familiar. Yeah. yeah. Although I suppose German is one of those languages that has lots of words for things that we don't have names for, but that's another, yeah. that's another kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. We're getting too serious. We need to get silly again. Okay. So, let's get silly again. <laughs> um, next question is about... Um, if homesickness, this book, was a food or a drink, what would it be? And on one hand, this is a very open question. It can be soft, hard, hot, cold drinks. Mm. If you're stuck, a food would be fine. On the other hand, I have a couple of stern authoritarian rules. Uh, you can't say a really strong coffee and you can't mm -hmm. say a cocktail mix of everything because that's been done to oh. oh, I thought you said, oh, if you if you can't think of what to say, you could say, say it's a cocktail mix. Can you, I say it's a buffet? That's probably not gonna not gonna fly. Um, but, if you um, can do those, if you can specify what's in the cocktail and what's in the buffet, okay, that's fine. What's in the buffet? Well, what's the restaurant that that serves uh, every different kind of cuisine? Oh, pan. It's like <laughs> it's, it's, it's a chain. Asian I think it's a Swiss chain actually. They also do really right. really good ice cream. Um, Moven Pick. Right. Is okay. it? If you can go to the Moven Pick restaurant, you can have uh, whatever uh, sushi in in this part of Moven Pick, and then. Spaghetti is over here, and Indian is over here, and Mexican is over here. It's okay. like whatever in the, you're in the mood for, you can get at Moven Pick. Interesting. So it's that kind of um, buffet, and uh, in one of the stories that I thought was very charming, but nothing happens in it. Uh, it's um, a story about this. Uh, it's called the Seafaring uh, French Horn, and uh, it's basically a letter that this one uh, young man is is writing to another young man. And uh, he's in love with him. I should. I don't think either of us have, have mentioned that Lai Zing is gay. No. And yeah. it's, uh, I think he would not be unhappy for me to describe him as a gay writer. Um, obviously, uh, that's not confining just 
the fact that he's a gay writer and he often writes about homosexual relationships doesn't mean that he's not writing about all the other kinds of relationships as in um, stories about uh, granddaughter and, and uh, grandpa or grandson and grandpa or, or uh, heterosexual lovers. But a lot of the stories are about, about gay relationships. So in The Seafaring French Horn, uh, it's about a relationship between a, a young man from Taipei and this Amis uh, indigenous person from East Coast uh, Taiwan. So he goes to visit um, his friend. Uh, his friend takes him home to this small indigenous village. And what do they have? Uh, rat and heart pork chops. And the mother uh, has gathered the rat and hearts herself. And she also serves him wild greens that she's picked herself, bamboo shoots that she's picked herself, and bitter melon salad. She's grown the bitter melon. Uh, herself. So it's kind of, uh, it's indigenous food, uh, traditional indigenous food in, in Taiwan. Part of it is grown, but but a lot of it is just gathered wild. And uh, in another story, uh, which you mentioned, uh, Silent Cicada, I think he has Tang uh, meatball soup, or it's called pork ball soup, I think it's called. It's not just meat. Uh, I guess even a meatball is, is meat mixed with other things, right? Spices, yeah. and maybe some starch. Anyway, so he has this meatball soup. It's uh, quotidian fare in, uh, in in Taiwan. It's not it's not uh, cuisine. I mean, it's not uh, sophisticated cuisine. But then, um, as a writer, we mentioned earlier that he's he's very literary. He's very well read. He's uh, quoting Chinese poetry, and uh, he quotes um, the Ballad of Reading Jail. Uh, Oscar Wilde writes so. I think uh, at the Moven pick, uh, there will also be uh, a fine fine dining section of, of the Moven pick where you could order uh, beef cordon bleu and, and borscht. There's a, a Russian character in one of the stories too. Oh yeah. So so it's kind of like a it's like a it's like an international buffet where you could you could order uh, ethnic cuisine from from all over the world, not just like national cuisine, Italian cuisine, Spanish cuisine, Mexican cuisine. You could also have like uh, indigenous tribal cuisine gathered gathered wild in Taiwan. So, so, uh, so that's the, that's the that's the kind of book it is. If if it, if if it were a, a kind of food, that's perfect. You know, over and over on Taiwan season, some of those things you talked about have come up. So I've not covered any indigenous literature, but um, it has always been sort of a right. presence. Um, I guess Han. Chinese or Han Taiwanese writers making an effort to include indigenous elements have been a theme in this Taiwan season. Uh, gay male writer, well, not just right, gay like male writers, me. but uh, LGBT writers, because we also had Chiu Miao Jin, have been really present. And I think this is at least the yeah. second time where I have picked an author who I just thought was, you know, just in quotes, a male writer. And then I find out halfway through the book or after I finished reading the book that they're, that they're a gay man and a have since learned that that's yeah. actually a big feature in, in Taiwanese literature. I went in totally not knowing that. Yeah. And then the other thing, which I did go in expecting, um, but have been continuously surprised by, is like the global global perspective. So this is in, in contrast to yeah. mainland Chinese lit, which I've done on the podcast before. Well, that has been what my podcast has basically been about, with some exceptions. And the presence of the non-Han minorities, with one exception, I think, um, doing um, Last Quarter of the Moon by um, Chu Zijian. Uh, with that exception, they're Did just... Did you get in... Bruce on to talk about it? Yes, yes, he was Did the guest. Did you talk to Bruce about it? Yeah, he was oh, the fantastic. guest on that yeah, one. I want, to, I want to listen to it. It's a good one, yeah. But I was going to say, apart from that, the non-Han minorities have been an invisible almost invisible in in the stories uh, i've right. done lgbt writers and characters again borderline invisible and internationalism has been there in the mainland chinese lit but it often feel has felt sort of stilted or the characters even if it's interesting the characters are just there as an archetype or they're serving a function to convey an mm -hmm. idea whereas in taiwanese the taiwanese stories i've read they feel more like people and even if they are being put there purposely they're also allowed to be individuals by the author i've no i feel right. i've noticed more well-rounded more well-rounded i think so i mean i'm per perhaps being a bit unfair on the mainline chinese lit i've read but the the contrast has jumped out at me for sure i was just wondering mm -hmm. if you think those three things are a product of taiwan being again in quote marks like a liberal society do you think they, those things spring from that or yeah yeah that's a good point yeah 
Uh, I, I don't have anything profound to say about this. Um, that's, that's a good theory. Yeah. I mean, it seems like almost too easy to make that conclusion yeah. on critically, but it seems quite common sense as well. I think there's something in it though. Um, yeah. Yeah. What is liberalism anyway? You, you're free to think and, and say what you, what you feel like. And nobody telling you how you should feel about about something, right? Or a certain kind of person, right? Yeah. They're cracking down on the LGB community now in, in China, right? They're cracking down on, on podcasts and, um, and on student organizations. I think like LGBT uh, club at, at clubs at universities or, uh, are, are getting cracked down on. So, I mean, if that's the situation and you're a writer... And you're going to be write about, writing about a homosexual character, and I think you'd be worried about the censor, wouldn't you? Uh, you wouldn't feel free to, to speak your mind. Uh, you might, uh, on the other hand, be like afraid of, of homosexuality, of homosexual people, and uh, that might get in the way of, of getting to know them. And in a liberal society, uh, you're free to, to say what you, you're also, you're free both to say what you think uh, about a certain kind of person or a certain issue. You're also, I think, uh, have more opportunity to actually get to know people that are that are different from you. And Taiwan's not just supposed to be liberal; it's also supposed to be multicultural and mm-hmm. um, accepting of different se- sexual or- orientations and just all sorts of different kinds of people. So, it, in in this kind of uh, society, you're you're more likely to get more well-rounded descriptions or representations of people in, in literature. I think that's I think that's uh, that's a great theory, Angus. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a better theory. Once you go into specifics like you've done, yeah, the fact that it's not all just about the simplicity of is it banned or is it not banned, but also what things are you just likely to run into in your life without seeking them out by merit of the fact that they're not forced into the margins. They don't have to hide. You you will encounter them, you'll get to know them and you can talk about them. That's right. uh, With other people who are able to talk about them. Yeah, it's more likely that you, you can overcome all of the obstacles, social obstacles that remain uh, in any society of class and, uh, and, and background. I just say one thing about uh, indigenous writers. Um, I, I'm writing an, an article now on, uh, or a chapter on uh, Umingi's uh, Fuyenren, the representation of indigenous characters. And um, I've got some anthropologist friends in Taiwan, people who study Taiwan's indigenous people. And um, sometimes they seem a little bit hostile to writers like Umingi who are writing about indigenous people without being indigenous people uh, themselves. So uh, it reminds me of debates about who has the right to write about another kind of person Mm -hmm. in terms of political correctness. Has that impacted you as a translator? Have you had to think about things like that? It's just like, it's something you have to think about. Um, Wasn't there a, not a scandal, but um, the translation of, uh, didn't didn't Joe Biden ask uh, some young black uh, poet to uh, to read um, at his inauguration, and then she was going to be translated into Dutch and then into Spanish. And they selected a, a, a translator that was not herself black, and uh, the translator was then taken off the case. Oh yes, is it a real chance for me to <laughs> put my foot in it here? So I will give it a, a oh. summary with no opinions. Um, yeah, the the Dutch translator was she was, or I should say, the Dutch translator was white and non-binary. So they uh, they were yeah. not black. The Spanish guy, I believe he was um, from Catalonia, but I think he was translated yeah, yeah, yeah. Spanish, not Catalonian. And I think he was a bit more of a what can I say? Um, put his foot like he 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 raised a little bit of a stink about it i think whereas the dutch translator just sort of acquiesced and said yeah i understand yeah. i will i will i will um step aside for a a black translator and i yeah. am making i'm not going to make my opinion known but yeah i saw that was all over twitter yeah uh so it relates to to what we're talking about here and that um i mean we're translating writers that are writing about other kinds of people sometimes marginal social groups that don't have a voice of their own. So Umingi has been published. Uh, he's a very high profile writer. He writes a lot about indigenous people. Where are the indigenous people who are able to write about themselves? They, they haven't appeared yet, except in a couple of collections. And um, uh, I think Columbia University Press is going to come out with a book by uh, Shaman Lampoine, the, the writer from Orchid Island, but it hasn't happened yet. So um, obviously a good thing uh, that Umingi can raise awareness about Indigenous people in his, in his fiction, it would be uh, an even better thing for Indigenous writers to be able to, 
to write their own stuff and 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 find an audience uh, for it. Um, so far, we're kind of stuck with Umi's depiction or representation of indigenous people. I'm I'm o- completely okay with him writing about uh, other kinds of people. I think writers should be able to write about whatever they want. I guess uh, with all this talk about political correctness, uh, you do hope that writers are being responsible or probably writers that we would want to, to read are going to hold themselves to our, a higher, higher standard and, and be responsible in their uh, representations of minority groups or marginal groups, disadvantaged groups, and, and not just let stereotypes uh, mm. um, make all the decisions for them. Yeah. Does, does that make sense, Angus? Yeah. No, that's, that's more or less. If I would voice an opinion, it's that, yeah, I wouldn't ever want a, a world where a writer like Woman Yi, who's trying to write beyond his, himself, yeah. is subject to like, n- not censorship, but like a censorious sort of atmosphere. I wouldn't want that. But at the right. same time, I wouldn't want to be reading his story and seeing him completely fumble or right. misrepresent those characters and then think oh come on man you're a smart man you could have um yeah could have tried a bit harder you gotta here. be responsible man. yeah yeah so i remember uh when that story about the translator was in in the news kanan morse uh translator uh now based in in taipei uh said that in a reductio ad absurdum pretty soon we're only going to be able to write about ourselves or we're only going to be able to translate stuff that fits in the narrow identity categories that, that we've been assigned to. It's, it is absurd. Yeah. It's absurd that the, this black translator or this, this uh, Dutch translator was taken off the black, the, the job because they're, because they're not black as if they couldn't, they just simply couldn't understand what it was, was like to, to be black. Are, are we really so unable to, uh, to understand anyone other than ourselves or anyone other than our, our narrow, whatever, uh, however we've been pigeonholed socially. Mm, it is a question for sure. Choose my words mm. carefully here. Um, yeah, I would. Mm. I think that definitely the reductio ad absurdum is scary. Everyone being in their own bubble. Mm-hmm. The question is whether that's going to happen, yeah. I suppose. But on the other hand, like we were saying with the knock-on effects of having a different status quo. So the knock-on effects of Taiwan being, sorry, Taiwan being liberal, and open has ha- has had knock on effects that go beyond what's censored, what's not. Similarly, if you have someone yeah. of a different background translating something, there's not just a box ticking of are they this or that identity. There's a knock on effect of how will their translation look like. Um, so, right. like doing this podcast, I've never set quotas, but I've always tried to have on um, you know men, women, straight people, not straight people, right, 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 um, and of course, of course yeah. people who are um, not just a plethora of white translators that would that would kind of suck Finally, yeah. i've never had to make that much of a conscious effort um but if it had yeah. gone that way i would have been worried i would have done something about it for sure because yeah, you've got to be representative sure yeah if if i knew i there was a one particular category of translator who wasn't who just wasn't published i would know i was missing something uh even though they're not the authors um themselves translators works do look different i can say that as a reader who's read so much of it but Mm -hmm. i I think that can be about identity or it can be like what they're like as a writer so for example some of my very favorite translated chinese books i've read have been translated by jeremy tiang who has all sorts of interesting things going on about his identity so he's um chinese singaporean lgbt but for me the really standout thing is he's an amazing writer He's an author as that's well great. as a translator. And that's what makes him one of my faves is his books are an absolute pleasure to yeah. read. They're one of my faves. Too. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I really wouldn't want to see identity ignored, but I would never want to see translators as creative writers themselves ignored. To me, that's really important. I said I wouldn't give an opinion. I failed. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, shall we Shall we go on to the next miscellaneous question? Say, so, yeah, I... But I mean, if somebody did say that uh, whatever uh, translators are are uh, play a different role in the in the creative process than writers of original novels, I, I think that's uh, that's fair. Mm. A lot of people, a lot of translators, especially, seem uh, committed to this idea that you're you're on an equal footing, translator and and the original creative writer on on an equal footing. Is that what you were getting at just now? Um, no, I think I was just saying that I want if I'm reading a translation, I want it to. I would ideally want it to be just as readable as a right. untranslated work. And if the translator isn't a good writer, 
that might not happen right, unless right, they've got right. unless they've got a good editor. I guess they're the unseen heroes, the editors. Yeah, I, well, I certainly aspire to that myself. So that that's it, really. Just the um, I worry that Twitter firestorms about identity can um, worry mm-hmm. the actual readability of of, of books. But that's mm-hmm. a worst case scenario. That's I don't think that's happening. That's a doomsday scenario, not the real situation. Mm-hmm. Well, I've used the words doomsday, so let's lighten the mood. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, if you've got anything you'd like to promote for the listeners, uh, if they're interested in your translations or your academic work or whatever, um, where could we point them? Well, I'll say a few words. I, I published a book um, called Indigenous Cultural Translation, uh, a thick description of Saedek Ballet. It's an academic monograph about this uh, feature film called Saedek Ballet. Have you seen it, Angus? I have not. Saedek Ballet. It's from 10 years ago. It's, uh, it's a commercial film. It's an uh, Indigenous historical epic along the lines of Mel Gibson's um, movie about uh, Scotland. Oh, Braveheart. What was it called? Yeah, yeah. It's along the lines of Braveheart. It was compared to Braveheart. But unlike Braveheart, it was filmed in uh, a language spoken by about uh, 5,000, 10,000 people now in, in central Taiwan. It's an Indigenous endangered uh, indigenous minority language in, in Taiwan. So it was translated from Mandarin. The screenplay rather was translated from Mandarin, Mandarin into this minority uh, indigenous language. Of parts of the screenplay were originally recorded in the indigenous minority language about 100 years ago by Japanese um, ethnologists and linguists, 1917 and 1935. And the, the texts were recorded. There was a myth and a, and a song recorded in, Jap- in, in the original language in Saedic and then translated into Japanese after the war. Uh, both versions of the story and the song, um, the original Saedic version and the Japanese translation, were translated into Mandarin. And in the mid-1990s, the director of this film, Wei Sung, who also wrote the screenplay, got access to these materials in translation in in Mandarin and put them in his screenplay. So partly the translation uh, of the Mandarin language screenplay into Saedic was a back translation into Saedic, but the song and and the story ended up very different a hundred years later. So comparing the original version from a hundred years ago with the back translation tells us a lot about cultural changes in uh, in Saedic culture, kind of the, the change in the way of life. They hundred years ago, they were uh, mostly independent, um, at least 150 years ago, they, they lived mostly independent lives, making everything that they needed in their daily life out of stuff in the, in the, in the local environment. They, they did trade to some extent, but most of the stuff they needed, they, they got from the, uh, the local environment. Today, they're just as modern as you and me uh, with cell phones and uh, screen addictions and everything else. They spent a lot of their time uh, typing stuff in, in the computer. So 150 years, there have been huge cultural changes in the, in the Saedic uh, community. Comparing translations and back translations will tell, tell us a lot about these translations. So I, I tra- tell us a lot about these uh, cha- cultural changes. So I've invested a lot of time and uh, emotion into uh, researching uh, Indigenous people in Taiwan, especially the Saedic. And now I'm trying to do uh, Saedic ethnobotany, how they're trying to record their traditional knowledge about plants and then translate that into Mandarin and then draw on Mandarin language texts in composing uh, texts in Saedic about plants and other uh, features in the natural environment. So they're translating both ways from Mandarin into uh, Saedic and then from Saedic into Mandarin. And hopefully uh, in this way, uh, translation is going to be a part of the uh, revitalization of the, of the knowledge. Because as I said, uh, only about five or 10,000 people uh, speak it. Most of these people are over the age of 50. So uh, there's been a failure to pass the language down to the next generation. People are hoping now that through translation, they can, they can pass the language on uh, from grandparent to, uh, to grand, grandchild. So that's what I'm going to be working. That's what I'm working on now. And that's what I'm going to be working on uh, for the foreseeable future as an academic. Right. Okay. Just like to give a shout out, shout out to small publishers. I'm, of course, I'm grateful to big trade publishers like uh, Harville Secker, part of Random House, and Text in Australia. I'm very grateful to these publishers for making it possible for Uming uh novels to appear in English. But I'm also really grateful to uh, small boutique 
literary publishers like Linda Leaf and uh, like Balestier uh, yeah. in uh, Balestier's a street in in Singapore. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Taiwanese uh, physicist who uh, quit his academic job, quit being a physicist and decided to start a publisher to publish Taiwanese literature in English. And the name of his uh, publisher is Balestier because he used to live or work on Balestier Street in um, in Singapore. It's spelled B-A-L-L-E-S-T-I-E-R. He's been uh, building the list for the past couple of years and I'm happy to have contributed two translations to it. One is called uh, The Tree Fort on Carnation Lane by Horace Ho, Tree Fort on Carnation Lane. And the other one, just gonna have to look up here. The name of the, of the novel as published in English is The Bear Whispers to Me. It wasn't my decision to, to title it this way. I was gonna call it The Story of a Bear and a Boy. That's by a writer called Zhang Ying Tai. Also, Honford Star. Honford Star is trying to make uh, pocket-sized um, uh, books, I guess, on the analogy of, or inspired by Penguin. Um, I think they started off doing Korean uh, classic uh, fiction, mm. um, and then they got in touch with me after uh, reading uh, The Man with the Compound Eyes to ask me if I would do Lai He, uh, who is the father it's called the father of Taiwan uh, literature. And so we ended up titling it under uh, Lai He's uh, Taiwanese uh, name, the ta- Taiwanese pronunciation of his name. Okay. And that's from them. That's fantastic. And there was a question about what book you're reading just now. Is, is there anything interesting on your sure. bedside table? Yeah. I read the Taipei Times and uh, the book <laughs> reviewer for the Taipei Times is a guy called Bradley Winterton. I never met him. And... Uh, about uh, 12 years ago, he reviewed a, a book called Lessons in Essence. Lessons in Essence. And it's a novel about uh, about Taiwan. About Have you ever been to Taipei? That's the one part of Taiwan I've been to. Yeah, Taipei. Okay. Well, it's it's about uh, Yangmingshan, uh, which used to be called Taoshan. It's just the big mountain in, in the north of uh, Taipei. And it's written by an American expatriate writer. She was in her 30s, young woman in her 30s, teaching English in Taiwan. Uh, I assume she was just in Taiwan for for whatever reason. And she wrote a novel about life in Taiwan uh, in Northern Taipei on on, uh, Yamingshan, uh, AKA Grass Mountain, Taoshan, except Mm. that there are no expatriates in the novel. There are no um, uh, Americans in the novel. An American writer in Taiwan writes a novel about Taiwanese people And lessons in essence, essence is the essence of beauty. So uh, the main character in the novel is uh, an older uh, man, uh, a teacher of uh, Gu Qin. Is it called the ancient Chinese zither? What's the usual translation of Qin? Yeah. He teaches the Qin and is a calligrapher and artist. And so beauty, what beauty is, is a big thing for him. And so he... uh, he isolates himself from uh, the grubby uh, um, environment that he that he lives in in Taipei. He goes up to Yamingshan into this uh, um, hermit's abode, a hermitage. He goes into this hermitage so he can think about what beauty is isolated from the the ugliness of of Taipei. And um, I guess uh, ultimately in the book, he he realizes he can't do it. <laughs> That uh, the ugliness of Taipei is part of is part of the beauty that he's been trying to understand his whole life. So this um, I'm getting all worked up here. This is my favorite novel. Anyway, what I'm reading now is a novel that the book reviewer who brought this Lessons in Essence novel to my attention, Bradley Winterton, had written and published uh, subsequently. I think he published uh, his novel in in 2017, just a couple of years ago. And the novel is called The Mystery Religions of Gladovia, uh, G-L-A-D, so Glad, Gladovia. And Gladovia is supposed to be this this, uh, kingdom in South America somewhere. And, uh, but it's it's in an author's interview, uh, Bradley Winterton said that it was actually about Taiwan. Um, Mm. But it's it's a novel about gay S&M. Oh my goodness. It's a philosophical novel about beauty. Uh, but it's also it also involves uh, a lot of gay S and M, 
And uh, Bra uh, Winterton, Bradley Winterton said that he didn't want to say that it was actually said in Taiwan because all of the, the, the people in the, in the international gay S&M community would have flocked to Taiwan and, and uh, turned up in, in Taipei expecting there to be a, a lively uh, gay S&M scene. And it's, it's really good. The Mystery Religions of, of Gladovia. Uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. It's, it's beautifully written and uh, it's, it's thoughtful, uh, has a very, very happy ending. And uh, the gay and S&M chapters were, were highlights of, of the novel. Okay. Really well done. Listeners take note. It's unscripted. It's a conversation. It's like uh, directed by questions. But when I'm giving a lecture at, at university, you kind of plan it out beforehand and you mm. try not to um and ah, and you try to make sure that everything each idea flows onto the next in a way that the students are able to understand. So it's it's uh, a lot more edited than than this has been. I hope I didn't go on and on too much. No, it's okay. I think that's um, that's the kind of podcast I try to make because that's the kind I like to listen to, ones with good tangents. So no, right. no sweat there. It's been great talking to you, Angus. Yeah, been great talking to you too. Right, we've reached the end of the show. Now, I'm not going to linger on the end plugs too long because like I said... It's very warm here. My throat's rather dry, but here we go anyway. So first plug, if you are a fan of the show and you want to give something back and you want to get something extra in return, then the Patreon is the best way to do it. The True Traffic Patreon. There are something like 60 odd bonus episodes up there. I've still, for like the next month or two, got one new one per week queued up there. If, if you want to hear sort of me reacting and rambling solo, Sometimes rambling, sometimes it's more formulated, but talking solo just about the things I've read, things I've covered on the show, and other things that I haven't covered on the show, for example, non-fiction books, uh, occasionally movies and stuff. Uh, the Patreon has got hours and hours and hours of stuff for you there. Um, One dollar a month is all, all you need to get access. You can, of course, contribute more. You would be a saint if you did so. So yeah, that's, that's the Patreon. There's also other ways to support the show, but that's the one I wanted to plug. Uh, social media. So, of course, you I'm sure you know by now, the places where you can connect with this podcast on social media are its Instagram account, at TrueTrufic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. I've got my own Twitter account, which is mostly just exists for the purpose of this show. That's at Angus Likes Words. We have a show Discord. It's generally quiet, but you're always welcome to share thoughts uh, there. You can talk to other listeners or myself on the Discord. There'll be an invite link in the show notes. And, of course, you probably know what I'm going to say if I'm a long-time listener. Social media and giving me money are, of course, wonderful things, but neither of them are the best thing you can do for the show. The best thing you can do for the show is spread the word. So if you have a friend, if you have a colleague, if you have an intellectual equal who you want to bestow this gift upon, tell them about the show. And of course, if you have a, a grandfather who's busy initiating you into the ways of the world, tell him. And if you happen to meet a bug that reminds you of that grandfather, tell the bug too, because I think that's a listener base we really need to expand into is the insect world. Because of course their numbers are fantastic. They outnumber us humans, what is it, millions of times or thousands of times? So I'd love to tap into the insectoid audience. That seems like a winner really, especially if I can kind of tunnel them onto the Patreon and they can get those bug bugs rolling in. But until I do that, I'll just say, Sajian.